Welcome to Uptown Rumble, heavy music in the Bronx. My name is Stephen Payne, director of the Bronx County Historical Society. Today is February 10th, 2024. Martin, uh, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself real quick? <laughs> yeah, hello everybody. I am Martin Gonzalez, a singer for Billy Club Sandwich, and also the singer for a new band called Brass Knuckle Brigade. Awesome. Really happy to be here with you today, Martin. And we're also here with uh, Muttley from Billy Club Sandwich. Hi. <laughs> Rep and I rate. Yes. Um, and, uh, and, and Muttley's going to probably ask some questions as well. Um, so, Martin, you want to start off by saying a little bit about your family history and background and whatever you might know about it and how your family ended up in the Bronx? Well, um, my family originally, well, my mom is originally from Dominican Republic, my dad's from Puerto Rico. Uh, they met up sometime in between while he was in the service, knocked up my mom, uh, was born in Dominican Republic, but raised in the Bronx, we came to the Bronx straight from Dominican Republic, and lived there for 23 years, 24 years. Okay. Been living there ever since, and... Uh, you know, transition as life has taken me, having two kids, wife at the time, and just moved out to Jersey. But that's how we came to the Bronx. How old were you when you came to the Bronx? Eight, nine years old, probably. Okay, okay. So you, so you have you have some memories from the DR then? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, Not yeah. as much as I would like to, but yeah. Where where do you all live in the Dominican Republic? Uh, there's a place called Aswa. And in Aswa, there's a little village called Padre La Casas, which is father of the houses. Aha. Uh -huh. yeah. and, and what was life there like for you? Poor. Yeah. Poor, man. Uh, you know, you want rice, you want beans, you go to the field to go pick that shit up. Yeah, you know? yeah, you yeah, want yeah, a chicken, yeah, yeah. you find whatever chicken you find in the, in the street at the time. Yeah. Kill it, pluck it up, you know, and we have dinner. Things have changed as, as I'm getting older, things have changed. Now there's, there's a street. There's actual road. It's not like before, you know, so things sure. are different. And did your grandparents live in that village too? Yep. They yeah. were born and raised there. Uh, actually, uh, maybe 17 years ago, my grandma died, passed away. And, uh, you know, my aunts and cousins are still living in the same house. Ah, okay, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so did you, was your family... A, a really like musical family when you were growing up with their music that you remember from the DR? The only thing that I can remember back in the days, especially in DR, is just a lot of Spanish, you know, merengue, salsa. Yeah. And when we moved back, in, when we moved into uh, the United States, straight to the Bronx, mom started picking up a lot of uh, Mexican music. Oh, okay, sure, so sure. She sure. started really enjoying the culture and and their music, the way they are, uh, the way they, they well, the way they dress, sure. the style of their food. Yeah, she's been taking some of that and just implementing in her cooking or, or the way she dress. So a lot of uh, the memories will come up with you know a lot of Mexican traditional songs. Ah, okay, yeah. okay. Wait, which part of the Bronx did you all live in when you, when you moved to the? Bronx? Uh, right across the street from Lincoln Hospital, 143rd Street of Morris Avenue. Ah, South okay, Bronx. okay, okay. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. And uh, like around what year or so was that? Which I can tell you, uh, probably in the 80s. Okay, the 80s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Probably in the 80s. Yeah, because I was born in 72, so I, yeah. Early, early okay, years. 80, 81, yep. like that, yeah. yep. And so you mentioned your mom being attracted to Mexican cuisine, Mexican traditions. Uh, I, in, in your neighborhood, were there already, um, you know, significant number of Mexicans? No, no, no oh, that's that's okay. Okay. no, not at all. Uh, I guess when I started more becoming a teenager, when I moved out of my house at 15, I started seeing more Mexicans around yeah. the area. Yeah. Um, but she picked it up by just, you know, local television and so, ah, and so forth. Yeah. I see. Going to supermarkets and also in where the religion that my mom is in, there's a lot of more Mexican, more uh, South Americans. Oh, sure, sure, So sure, she sure, starts, sure, sure. you know, taking in and, you know, just being part of their brotherly congregation and just going from there. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. Very cool. So what was it like when you first landed in the Bronx? Uh, what, what are some of your memories from around that time? What were your impressions? 
memories, the first kind of type of memory I could remember is Karis One. Um, Karis One, if awesome I remember, remember correctly, if I remember he was homeless at the time. I yep. think he was living, he was rapping in the streets. Uh, there was a huge project party that I remember, huge speakers. Karis One, Eric B. and Rakim. Ah, uh, some old, old, old uh, rappers and, and listening to what's going on. Slowly but surely, I started only listening to rap and it started helping me learn my English language. Yeah, sure, sure. And as time goes by, as I growing up, I started losing the Spanish language. Uh -huh. And then being back with my mom, living at that time, she kept pushing me, pushing me. Hey, we need to start learning again. And that's why I got back to where I'm at now. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Uh, did you have other family members that came to the Bronx when your immediate family came to the Bronx? No, it was just me, my dad, and my mom. And then a couple of years later, my sister was born. Oh, okay, so, okay. It's just you and your sister? Yeah, just okay. me and my sister on my mom's and father's side. On my dad's side, uh, I had two brothers and a sister. Okay, sure. She's still living. My brother, Tito, passed away maybe a couple of years ago. And then an older brother who I barely remember. I but see. he passed away when I was a child. I see, I see, I see. Um, and when you came to the Bronx, um, what was the first school that you started attending in the Bronx? Wow. PS18. PS18, okay. PS18. That's right across the street from Lincoln Hospital. Uh-huh. Yes. And what, what was PS18 like at that time? Uh, well... It was more like a trauma situation because my mom gave a lot of authorization to teachers to beat the shit out of me. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It wasn't like none of these fucking young kids nowadays. No, this was different. You know, if, if the authorization was given by your parents, trust me, they would take full advantage of that shit and beat the fuck out of you. So that's what I, uh, that's what I do remember. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, wow. yeah. So I guess I guess that would, you would have been at that school for what, like a year or two before you went to junior high school? To junior high school. Was, yep, which was IS 183, which is three blocks to the left. Okay. okay. And was, was, that, was that still a beatdown situation there? Uh, I learned a beatdown because I was getting beatdown. <laughs> Uh, I got my lunch taken away from me many times, yeah. you know, and, uh, you know, it was just bad. I was, I was a punk. I was a pussy. You know, it, it was, it was really bad. It was, yeah. I even got beat up in front of my dad at lunchtime. Damn. I remember one time some black guy, my dad had a, a, a Chevy. Yeah. Caprice Classic. Okay. Okay. It was an 83. Brown. And I remember that he had it lifted up and he was like, hey, pass me this. And I was helping him change the uh, tire. And some black guy, for whatever reason, just swung at me and I swung back. But I didn't know what to do after he swung back. Yeah, so sure. just kept clocking me, clocking me, clocking me. And so I just had this big black guy in front of a couple of girls that I really liked. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just kept taking my ass beat until, <laughs> until high school. I say, oh man, so so rough, rough junior high. Experience. Oh, rough public school, rough junior high. Then I got into high school. And that changed. Which high school did you go to? Right next to PS eighteen, a couple of blocks uh, down. It was Alfred E. Smith High School. Ah, uh, Alfred E. Smith. Uh, well, I was okay. in the school with Barry. With Barry, that's right. Yes. And then there's there's a group of a group of you all who I guess were into into metal. We'll get into that. Well, later, right. <laughs> So let me let me start with that. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead, start with that. You know, it, uh, I walked into school, you know, walking into school, and I saw a bunch of, uh, you know, metalheads. And I guess I was transitioning into, like, rock. And so I had a glam shirt, I don't, I don't remember, probably Poison. Okay, yeah. Po probably Poison or Rat, I don't know, it was one of them. And uh, I was like, hey guys, what's up, man? You guys got any Poison videos? And it was just, <laughs> they just laughed at me. It was very oh embarrassing. But Barry was the one who took me under my wing. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Yes. Yeah, he gave me Sepultura. And I listened to Sepultura. Oh, shit. 
And as time goes by during the school year, he was like, all right, you're going to graduate to DSI. <laughs> <laughs> Boy. You weren't expecting that. I had, I had the Bible next to me right before I listened to the lyrics or listened <laughs> to the song. I would read a couple of Bible texts and just, wow, this was a very strong uh Strong album, but as time goes by, I started loving it. He gave me the first album, and right from there, I started, you know, really enjoying it. If it wasn't because of Barry giving me the chance to uh, be in his band as a singer, and it just went from there. Wow. So, so be be before we even even uh, get more into that, though, you were already, you know, when you hit high school, already, you know, you're into Poison and, and glam and, and rock and some of the some of that stuff already. How'd you get into that? So I have a cousin who used to be in Go Go Dolls, Go Go Dolls, Go Go Blow Dolls, it's some shit like that. Yeah. But he was a very uh, vampire-ish, goth, <laughs> Bajas type of dude. Ah, I see, I see, I see. So he would, I think he had like a, like a semi-coffin as a bed. <laughs> and he was my cousin, so every time I go to the house, I go straight to him. <laughs> and a lot of the shit that I saw, I was like, wow, this, this is like really diabolical. Fucking cool at the same time. Uh -huh. And then uh, his sister was listening to a lot of rock and a lot of uh, Thompson Twins and uh, uh, White Wedding. Was the guy? Oh, Billy, 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 Billy Idol. Idol. Right. So I started really enjoying that. And, and you yeah. know, I started taking that as, all right, I'm a rocker now. You yeah, know, yeah, until yeah, high sure. school. Wow. Yeah. So where where'd your cousin live? Did they live close to y'all? Okay. They lived in Co-op City. Oh. Co-op okay, City. Okay. Co-op City, yeah. I see. And uh, before they moved out, before my, my aunt passed, they were in across the street from the project of St. Raymond Cemetery. Oh, I see, I see, I see, I right. see, I see. Right. So it was a very... Uh, Another project that was wasn't nice. <laughs> sure, 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 sure. So yeah, sure. and and uh, you didn't. I don't think you mentioned this, but which building did your family live in? I can't remember. It was so it was one street. It was the cemetery, one street, and then another street. It was right on that corner. Uh, I can't remember exactly. Yeah, but, sure, sure, sure. Because sure. uh, mentally, I can remember where. Exactly. Sure, and. And yeah, talk more about, you know, growing up in that building and, and what things were like. In that building, seeing my family, you know, it was really awesome. You know, again, you know, because uh, she was my favorite aunt, always giving me a little, you know, a couple of dollars in my hand without letting my mother or my father see. Yeah. Uh, always had cookies and donuts, so it was very awesome to be there. She, even her daughter to this day has the... Uh, Turtle that my aunt had at one point. Really? I think yeah, the turtle was like forever, right? Ninety-seven, ninety-eight years old right now. Jeez. <laughs> turtle still living. Turtle still living. <laughs> wow. But it was it, it was difficult being in that area, you know, uh, coming to see my aunt and uh, being left there because there's not really much that I could do in around that area. Yeah, 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 yeah. But when my cousin come back from work or whatever, I just hang out with him. And, yeah, sure. Here, listen to this. Yeah. Here, listen to that. You know, he's he was definitely the one who got me into Bajas. You know? I see. I see. And what, what about your mom's building? What, where was that at? That was across the street again from Lincoln Hospital. Yeah. It was 143rd Street. It was 271 East 143rd Street. She used to live on the third floor. Every floor had one, two, three, four, five apartments. So okay. five apartments go for one to three bedroom apartments. I see. You know, 13 story high, and it was just the projects. You know? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, being there was wasn't great at one point, but it made me really uh, be the person who I am now. For all the ass whipping that I got from my transition from being a metalhead with a lot of hair, and now being a skinhead, uh -huh. and, you know, white shirt, red suspenders, blue jeans, black boots, oh, red. Man. Right, and people did not like it. You know, I got <laughs> my ass beat a couple of times. You know, oh, hold on, go back a second. What was it like when you were when you were rocking the long hair? Oh my god! What was it like in the projects? Uh, I was gay. I I, I was. They was. They told me I was gay. I was a drug addict. Yep. Uh, they found so many different excuses of what to put. Uh, you know, label me. Sure. Uh, 
certain parts, uh, certain time frame during school that people would throw uh, gum in my hair oh, or shit like that. Oh yeah. Yep. Oh yeah. But uh, you know, to see a long hair brown dude in the projects was not a good look. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> At all. Yeah, yeah. And then especially going to transition from metalhead to skinhead. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it was. It was. It was difficult. <laughs> so we'll we'll get more to that transition in in a second, but uh, um, but just to dwell more on you know the reaction of the wider community to you know your metalhead phase as far as appearance goes. What what your family think of you know how you looked, the music you listened to? All oh, I was the son of Satan <laughs> <laughs> for a very long time. <laughs> My mom, uh, when we came to this country, my mom was complete Catholic. She was uh, pretty much like a spiritual advisor to a lot of different people. Sure. She used to dress up in white with a lot of different beads. Something he, uh, sure, sure, sure. Uh, to this day, I still consider my mom a witch because she knows a lot of shit that I haven't even done yet. <laughs> <laughs> done yet. <laughs> But uh, when she went into the transition from being into Catholic Santeria and then into Jehovah's Witness, uh -huh. that's when everything changed. Yeah, I bet. Uh, so it went from having crosses and statues in the house to not having a single thing. It went from celebrating birthdays that I remember to not celebrating anything at all. Wow. Uh, the shirts that I wore, the music that I listened to, even prints. Prince, to my mom, was the most gayest dude in the world. Uh -huh. uh, listening to music, listening to any music that has to do deal with guitar, screaming, or lead picking, not 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 acceptable in the house at all. Yeah. So yeah. that was very hard. So thank God for Walkmans and CD players, uh -huh. and that's all I listened to. And that's when I, you know, just. Kept everything to myself for a long time. I see. Yeah. I see. Wow. Um, so, so talk more about, you know, transitioning more into being a metalhead when you're in high school. You know, obviously Barry's introducing you to things. Did you make friends in that wider, like, metalhead community at Alfred E. Smith? Well, uh, yeah, I made a lot of friends. And let me start off with also with Gary. We started going to, going with Barry, started going to a lot of different death metal shows, deathcore shows. And we would take the, we all would meet up, we would take the train. And little by little, as you take the train and you get all the way to your stop, there's a lot of people going on to the trains, right? Mm -hmm. As that's happening, it starts accumulating more and more and more. Oh, yeah. Same thing I did with Muttley at one point when we started seeing each other in the same train station. It was like, hey, yeah. how you doing? And you just got a Pantera shirt, like, you're on the show. <laughs> right. Uh -huh. So it just worked out that way. Um, and then slowly but surely, I started meeting a lot of people from the hardcore scene. Okay. Uh, it went from Glenn. It went from, it went from Muttley to Glenn. Warren, who's been a roadie for Slayer for what? He, he was tour manager for Slayer for a long time. He was, work, he was working for Rancid recently. Now he's going to go work with Kerry King. Oh, I look think. at that. I ain't even but he's, he's been working as a tech and a tour manager for you. So as time goes by, we we'll start meeting different people, yeah. and, you know, and, and it just gets more and more. And then at uh, one point, Bond Street opened up. Aha. Uh -huh. And when Bond Street opened up, Glenn was the first one to be like, hey, there's a show that you really need to go see. And it was VOD. <sighs> Can't hear you, maybe? No. VOD. I don't remember who else was playing, but I do remember sitting in the back right by the sound booth and somebody opening up an umbrella <laughs> <laughs> with no material of the umbrella, just the, the just spikes. Metal. Oh my God. I remember Going that. like this on stage with two guitarists, a drummer, and a singer. And VOD destroyed no, the place. No bass player. No bass player at the time. For a long time, they played with no bass player. And wow. it was, I was like, holy shit, this is what I want. Wow, mm -hmm. so that, that was your first hardcore That show. was my first hardcore show. Wow. Yeah. Did you get into the pit in that show? Hell no. 
<laughs> Yo, you, you saw that umbrella, you said fuck that. Uh, I got used to all this pushing shit, and now seeing all this karate, swinging the arms, somebody having like little blades in their hands while they're swinging, or a small little hammer. Uh, no, 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 no. So, so b- b- before that first hardcore show, what are some of the the metal shows you were going to leading up to that? Or if you remember your first metal show, even. Let's start with that. Oh, my first metal show. Uh, we should definitely uh, call Barry for that one. Because uh, <laughs> well, Barry was let definitely. Me, let me ask you this. Did you ever go to arena shows or did you go strictly to. Live nights. Yeah, club Not shows. like Magic Square Garden. No, no, no. no. Okay. okay. Not until way later. Oh, okay. okay, okay. So club shows, okay. Yeah. Um, and what about. At the, during this period of your life, like, you know, this is all high school, I'm, I'm guessing. Um, was there anything that you knew of happening in the Bronx as far as shows or bands? Or like At that? the time, no, I did not know until I started meeting more and more people from the Bronx. Yeah. Like I said, uh, with Mudley, meeting Mudley, it was like another, uh, another chamber just going through different paths of the different people that I met. You know, I can't tell you that I met, that I was hanging out with Mutley and Phil was there when I didn't know him, you know, because at that time, Phil from my rate and his guitarist, Nando, would would hate on me Uh, (laughs) because we was in the pit. Uh And if you see Nando, Nando's a big husky guy and, you know, there was a lot of, you know, you know, for me type of thing. You know how it is if you don't know somebody immediately, like, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was yep. a lot of that. So, of yeah. that. And then all of a sudden, you become lifelong friends. That's how it worked. <laughs> yeah, that's how it actually worked. You know, there was a lot. There's a there's a nice still handful of people that's still friends of my friends of ours. Yeah. And it's over twenty some odd years. So I feel blessed so about thirty that. some of you. Okay, never mind. Thirty <laughs> <laughs> some odd years. You know? Wow, wow, wow! And and I, a lot of these people are people you just. Saw the subway station who had yeah. band shirts on and started same, talking yeah. to him, right? Same thing with Rob EGH. I did the same thing with him. And, you know, uh, again, because of Glenn going to these little shows, yeah. I started meeting all these other people had it here and there. And it just, yeah. just blew up, you know? There's certain people that you just click with immediately. Yeah. There's just some people that it'll take you 27 years to be like, oh, you're actually cool. <laughs> It happens. Yep, it so, it happens. So go back for a second. Just talking more about the Bronx specifically. Like, I know there were a few things popping, like the Chippewa Club. Like, uh, like I know around Go to Mensa's time, like there was that backyard show. On, on was was the Ho like or they started talking about a, f- a few different streets. There's Valentine Avenue shows. There are Avenue yes. shows. Yes, yeah, a little yeah, yeah. again. So we're, we're meeting all these people from the Bronx, especially meeting him, especially knowing Barry. Yeah, you know Barry went into another connection with another with a lot of different uh, heavy metal people. I guess it was uh, MySpace at that time. No, mm-hmm. that, was, that was way before. Uh, that, before? Was, that was before the internet. Yeah, because you're talking about like early nineties. Fuck yeah, you're right. You see why I needed him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I know, I know. Barry used to hang out like they're you know basically just in front of a building with a bunch of uh, metal kids. So there was uh, this, and I, and I want to say this was like time frame of Lime Night, the club Lime Night. So early, early to mid nineties. Yes, there was Rob, a guy named Rob who was just a Pantera lover. Uh-huh. There was another guy who was just a pure skinhead. There was another dude with long, long hair. And then there was the most important dude. His name was Rui. <laughs> oh. He used to be in a band called The Wasted. Yep. Yep. But not only that, his magical fucking tricks that he does, fuck. Like, he'll, he'll make coins disappear oh, in front of you. About that. <laughs> so he was in the magic then. Oh, my God. <laughs> And the way he draws was just phenomenal. Wow. And we just stuck with that crew. We yeah. just hung out a lot. And then slowly but surely, from what I remember, uh, Rampage started coming out at that time. Uh, and, uh, yes, that, yes, this yes. was way before Close Call, too. Sure, sure, sure. Um, and then, again, it started gravitating more to, towards that. You know, it just... I, I don't know how else to explain it. It just... 
went real right right into that and with no issues, you know. It was fun. And before before Godamentis comes to be and all, were you thinking about taking up an instrument or being a part of a band or anything like that? Had that entered your mind? It entered my mind when I was taking a shower and all the ha the hair that I had was just flowing over with, with water and I just be headbanging <laughs> for no fucking reason. There's no music, but I'm fucking headbanging and playing air guitar and that's all I wanted to do. And, and I really wanted to do that. But when Barry gave me that opportunity to sing, I'm like, fuck it, yeah, I'll do it. But again, he started giving me different albums and that yeah. maybe I should put my voice like that. Yeah. And just went from there. So you might not remember because, you know, I'm sure the musical taste, like it's hard to really separate, you know, different periods of your life. But right around that time, do you remember some of the albums that were like most formative for you as a singer, like, you know, mm. vocalist that you were really drawn to at that time? Shit. Guns N' Roses' Appetite for Destruction. Okay. <laughs> what was Warren's band? Out of line queens. Out of line queens. Uh, what they what they sound like? Oh, I don't even know how to describe it. It was like a steroid version of leeway without the leads. Oh, okay, all right. Some of the riffs were kind of right, right, right. Like the right. singing was different. And then I started picking up people like Steel Soup. Oh, Steel Soup, wow. Fuck wow. with his style, but again, well, they were they were standoff at first. That's right, yes. that's right. Uh, okay, but who really, really took a big portion of it was Max Cavalier. Uh huh. Sure, sure. One hundred percent. Absolutely. Yeah. Which 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 Sepultura albums do you do you like gravitate towards still to this day? Beneath the remains. Yep. 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 And. What was the next album after that? Uh, let's Arise. Say, Arise. Yes, and those two. Yeah. After that. Those yeah. two. Yeah, yes. CD was a little later, like nine. Yes, right, yeah, right, 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 right. Which is okay. Which but, is still one of my but, favorite but, albums. Beneath the Remains was like probably 89, 90. I think 89, yeah. Arise was shortly after that. Yeah. And yeah. that, that, uh, da 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 So, you know, water coming down my hair. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so on, on the hardcore side of things, you know, obviously your first show, VOD, um, what are some of the hardcore bands that you uh, were really into at that time? Sick of it all. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Agnostic Front took me a while because of the fast tempo punk style. Yeah. I did not understand that. Uh, again, and until I met Glenn. Um, damn, who else can I? Can I bring up? Not really much. Uh, VOD. Yeah, not really much that I can really come off off of my head. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can't tell you right now. <laughs> Do you remember, you know, either the events or what you were thinking that inspired you to to shave your head, put on the boots, put on the suspenders? Like, what what encouraged you to make that transformation? Mm. Getting beat up. <laughs> <laughs> That's another story by right? so, It was making arrangements with Glenn to go to CBs. Ah, okay. Making arrangements with Glenn going to CBs, meeting up with Mutley. Uh, I started looking at, I started seeing uh, Luna Chicks with Mutley, with yeah. Angel, wow. with the silent producer. His name is Rich. Oh, wait a minute, was I supposed to not say that? Anyway, <laughs> so, you know, and then just going to, to see these all the time and seeing everybody's style just started really... I see. I started picking that up, you know, and I then uh, started understanding sharps. Ah. Uh, right from there. When you went to the hardcore shows and you still had the long hair and all, would you get crap for it? All the time. Yeah. All the time. I, I don't think I, I went to a show by myself. I see. Uh -uh. I, <laughs> I learned my lesson after a couple of shows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, how long was it between you know when you became a skinhead and appearance and everything, and when Go to Mentis started? If you remember, were they around the same time? Was there a bit of a delay? It was a bit of a delay because I know I remember again right from high school started with uh, Go to Mentis. 
We play a couple of shows after a certain amount of time when I started really enjoying hardcore. That's when I started changing my transition. Oh, okay, okay. I see. Uh, I see. Instead of having a, just a black flight jacket like everybody else had, I had a red one. Okay. So uh, when we would go to shows at Wetlands, I would be called pole position because I'd be hitting oh, the poles all the time. That was that was a specific incident. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'd be called Big Red. Oh, Big Every Red. Day. Okay. <laughs> well, the pole position thing, Wetlands. Yes. Uh, Enrage was playing. Holy shit. Perfect. <laughs> yes. Enrage. Holy oh, shit. I was just talking about this because I was at one of Drew Stone shows and Jeff from Enrage walked by and then like somehow Glenn and I were telling the pole position story to somebody. Uh, Enrage is playing and Martin just puts his head down yeah. and he's like running around but Wetlands had a p- big pole and Martin just goes Boom! Right into the <laughs> Head first. The dude from Enraged thought it was a fight because all of us just ran him into the back room. He was like, you okay, Martin? You okay? But that's that's where pole position came from. Wow. That's a lot of stories. <laughs> oh, my God. So, so, so while we're on stories of potential injuries at shows, uh, <laughs> did, did you get... Did you ever get injured very bad before? Before you know, not on the you know, not on the band side of things, but when you were just attending shows, um, <clears throat> did you ever get injured very badly? I got injured a couple of times. Yeah. Uh, my back gave out. I stage dive at a CB show. I stage dive at a limelight show. Uh, couldn't feel my arm forward for a long time. Couldn't feel my leg. Uh, Do you remember coughing up dirt? Oh, so I was at Lollapalooza with this son of a bitch. <laughs> it was the second Lollapalooza when uh, it was like Primus, Alice in Chains, Rage Against the Machine. Rage Against the uh, Machine was on first. Uh, this was when they were starting to blow up. That's okay. how. So it what was, was that 93, 93 or something? It was either 92 or 93. 92, 93. Okay, yeah. Uh, Rage Against the Machine went on. I guess it was a really good song. And this was in a place called Waterloo Village in Jersey, where it's all just grass and dirt. I see, I see, I see. So the pit is just a yeah. giant cloud of dirt getting kicked up. And this dude's in his Doc Martens, and everybody after the set is all just like, <laughs> up Because it all got kicked up so much. Oh, yeah. Because everybody was just breathing in because we were all in the pit. Oh, just, my God. <laughs> and then a circle pit happened, and yeah. I, I know I fell and just took a huge amount. I thought I was sniffing coke. Uh, <laughs> but it was, a, <laughs> it was a huge fucking pile of fucking dirt. And I, <laughs> I was like, oh. So if it wasn't for him, man, he picked me up. <laughs> right, let's go. It was so bad. Wow. But I don't really remember getting hurt really bad. That was the, one of the worst experiences. Oh, okay. Okay. I that see. took a while. I now, see. going on being on a band, we can talk about that later. Okay. We will. We will. We will. For sure. For sure. Um, so, why don't you talk about the original Go to Mintus lineup? And, I mean, you know, know how you met Barry, but how, how did you know the other guys in Go to Mintus before Slowly you Slowly we started, you know, uh, Barry with his, the, you know, the way he would uh, communicate with other people and just, you know, branch off into the community. He started getting little people here and there. And then we met Rendon, Rendon the Mexican that he was at, I think, Barry School at one point. Yeah. We met we met up at one point and we just started playing, you know, and, and, it, and it formed in a way that, uh, you know, we didn't know what to talk about, what to sing about. It was like, oh, let's just stay with the original shit. Do you remember what year that was? Was it like 92, 93? I'm going to say 93. I'm going to say 93. Yeah. Okay. yeah. 93, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And did you all have any discussion at that time of how you all wanted to sound, or you just started playing? And we just started playing. Merged? Just started playing, but we started, we really sat down, because again, everything that Barry gave me, I was like, you know, why can't we just, you know, put two styles together? Well, what are you talking about? I was like, well, we got the hardcore that, it's great, yeah. And this let's use a death metal, you know, for uh, for verses and you know for chorus, and let's do the breakdown as a hardcore band. Yeah, just 
started changing up our style, you know, and it just went right from there. I think there was a point in time where we started considering ourselves uh, a deathcore band. Yeah. Before anybody used that term. That's right. Right, but we can't say that because at the same time, All Out War was coming up too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very so I, there's, there's something that me and me and Glenn keeps, I'm not sure, it's not an argument, but we both disagree on the time frame that we both came up. Because yeah. we were pretty we much right around that same time. One of the first bands that said, "But it was just totally different tracks." Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Where Where did Golden Mentis practice? Oh, it's that place in the Bronx, right by Wood. Oh, oh, oh so by Manchester Road? Road. Yes, yes. Music yeah. Unlimited. Music Unlimited. Okay. Music okay. Unlimited. That's where they did some of the shows at too. Yep. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's where you all would practice. But yeah, I see. I see. Um, I think. I think Barry mentioned, at least for a period of time, this might have been after you left already, there was like a basement in Throg's Neck or something that the band practiced in as well, but... I probably left might have been that after, time, yeah. yeah. Um, so talk about, you know, if, if you remember your first show with Go to Mentis, where was that? What was that like? It was in Bond Street. Okay. It was in Bond Street, and I told Barry that I wanted to be different. I, I wanted to be unique. So I came in a, in a zoot suit. <laughs> <laughs> Black and white checkered suit. Holy jack shit. and pants. <laughs> That's different, right? Black wow. socks. Black. I remember black uh, shoes, red suspenders, and a red tie. Wow. <laughs> I remember that was our first show. And uh, I don't remember really much during the show. But I remember, you know, just sweating my ass off and everybody just really enjoying this play. <laughs> <Wow. Yeah. laughs> do, you, do you remember other, the other bands that were playing that night with y'all? Uh, yeah, I need Barry for that. Oh, yeah. No, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Just, yeah. I, he, he already mentioned it yesterday anyway. Just, you know, it's always good to see who remembers what. And right, 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 right. But what about the Blue Frog? Do you remember playing there? Fuck, right under the four train. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that was... Uh, I think that was the second show, maybe. Yes, yes. Right. That was probably the second show. I remember inviting a lot of people who's not into the music. Uh, got a lot of, what the fuck is that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Were you in a zoot suit or... No, no, no. This time I was, you know, more, you know, just more form, more hardcore form, would you yeah, say. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. But yeah, no, I, I did have a lot of hair at that time and... Uh, I remember some band talking shit about us who was still supposed to be friends with us or whatever. I remember talking shit on stage. Barry still has the footage. Yep. Uh, yeah, I was talking a lot of shit. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I do remember a lot of it. No, I remember stage diving with only 20 people there. <laughs> I got caught. I got caught. I, I swear. But yeah, I think that's really most of the stuff that I remember. I think that's the. I think that's the first and only time that there was a show like that at Blue Frog. Maybe I haven't heard of anyone else mentioning. Black or Black, Blackout. They've done a few. Oh, yeah, they did a few. Okay, I okay, do okay. remember seeing uh, Blackout there as a headliner. I remember see, that. I see. I see. I see. Yeah. So there are a few then. Okay. Oh yeah. I don't I'm think it lasted that. very long, but they no. did a few. They I definitely see. did more than one. I see. I see. I see. Um, and then I guess, you know, it, it, it couldn't have been more than a year or two probably before y'all went to the train depot. Do you remember much oh, about the shit. train depot? Not too much. I yeah. don't remember too much of train depot. I remember almost getting, yes, when I almost got arrested. I was just going to say that. Was <laughs> <on my list. laughs> That was one of the big ones. That, Let's hear it. If you, if you want to tell it. There's a train depot <laughs> story for the, sure. Why did I almost get arrested? The drinking. I, I guess I got to start the story and then you'll remember. The train depot. Should I get on camera? Yeah, sure, sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. So the train depot was on Williamsbridge Road and Lydig Avenue. Okay. And I went there because I used to be, I could walk there. I grew up on Morris Park and White Plains Road. Um, one night, I forget who else was playing. I know All Out War was playing. Close Go to Mentis was playing. Close Call was playing. And No Redeeming. No Redeeming wasn't playing, but they were there, I think. Okay. Because that was a whole other thing. Is this the infamous 
Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. No <laughs> pants on. Sick. Yes. Yep. So this happens to be completely, that was a very busy night. A <laughs> very busy night. So um, we're all outside. This is in the early 90s. We're all outside on the corner lighting in, in Williams Ridge. And most of us are drinking like 40s or something. And the cops roll up in a van and start giving shit. They're like, we want everybody's IDs. And like, we're all just like, oh, great. And then Martin's like, what did you say? I'm like, sir, we don't want any trouble. Something like that. I forget. And the cops are like, oh, we got a talker, huh? Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Oh, shit. I try to defuse the situation and just be and nice about so, it. <laughs> so Martin's uh, trying to be the nice guy. The cops are like, oh, we got a talker, huh? So, hey, uh, they check everybody else's IDs and they're like, hey, you know what? You know, since you want to be the representative, why don't you come take a ride with us? <laughs> oh, God. So Martin gets in the van and the cops take off. Now, keep in mind. 20 minutes? 20, 30 minutes. Go to Memphis is supposed to play. <laughs> so everybody's like, fuck, what are we going to do? Like, what if they don't bring him back? What if he goes to jail? Like, what, like cause they just took Martin and took off. Yeah. So everybody's sweating bullets. Band starts setting up. We're all just like, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. And then all of a sudden, like five minutes before set time, Mark comes rolling back in the club. And we're all just like, okay. They was just fuck with me. And, and, and they, and, yeah, and they just fucked with him. They just took him for a ride, brought him back, oh, wanted to scare him a bit. And then Martin just comes rolling in and then on stage going to Memphis. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, that's how it rocked. Wow. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Classic. <laughs> that was a classic. <laughs> Thank you, 49th person. <laughs> uh, so, as far as the songs that you all were writing and performing at this time, um, how involved were you in like the writing process? The writing process, I wanted to do things differently. I... I I wanted to keep the same norm uh, with the death metal and the, uh, the, the you know, the, the mutilating, the diabolical, uh -huh. you know, denouncing God and all that shit. And I do remember there was a one time where we was practicing at Frankie's house, the drum. Oh, uh, that's right. That's right. You, you practiced that. And, right? you know, we're, we're, we're singing, there's no God or some denouncing God song and there was a cross on the top of right on top where he was playing and the cross just <laughs> <laughs> we didn't pay no mind we kept playing Frankie puts it right back and the cross again and <laughs> we're done playing <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but it was that type of music. It was that type of uh, style with the lyrics. You know, sure. I wanted a, you know, there was even a specific song that I wanted to, you know, do the the Holy Mary, Mother of God uh, prayer. Sure. Backwards. Ah, uh, okay. You know, so there was just different oh, ideas. That I that's right. That's right. Yeah, you were talking about, so, talking about that. Go back a second. Because... We have to talk about how Go Mentis became the verb. Oh, yes. Because your lyrics at the beginning, there was no lyrics. Uh, <laughs> now, <laughs> let, me, let me ask you this. There, there was a big band that did that also. Did you know that Obituary did that for their first record? Really? See, there I were no not, written lyrics. I did not know that. He was just off the top. Yep. But that's why go to Mentis is a verb because then Martin would always like he was just freestyling stuff and that's what he did with the early go to Mentis stuff. So uh, 
we would always be like, oh, do you have lyrics written out, or are you just going to go to Mentis it for now? <laughs> and that's how go to Mentis became a first. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, so when you when you joined up with Go to Mentis, was the name was the name already in place? Did, did Barry we were just throwing was? names around. Oh, okay, okay, just, okay. You know, uh, Barry was the one who was like, "Ooh, go up Mentis for the Bronx, bro. We got to change this." Oh wait, <laughs> go to Mentis. You know, and it just went. We just took it right from there. Worked out very well, actually. <laughs> it did. Worked out very well. Oh wow. Um, so. You, from the period that you're performing with Go to Mentis, what are some of the shows that stand out most to you? Go to Mentis. Some of the shows. Train Depot. Okay. So Train that, Depot, Blue Frog. Uh, yeah, those are the two biggest shows that I felt like. Uh, Bond Street. Bond Street. Bond yeah, Street yeah. 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 Those those type of shows. I don't really have too much more memories of that. But sure. those are the most ones that always comes to mind. Okay, I see, I see. And you obviously already knew Muttley at this time, um, but why don't you talk about, you know, the transition to Billy Club, how all of that came about, um, whatever you remember from there. So, I was crying one day, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, there was a day that I, I was in Orchard Beach with my son's mom, uh, uh, my kids wasn't born yet. I was hanging out with her family, meeting them also. And there was a party or something? Yeah, it, was, it, was, it was somebody's birthday party. They did it in Orchard Beach. And just this one day, I decided... You Which know, is a very Bronx thing. Absolutely. 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 <laughs> yeah, I decided, yeah, I'm going to go take a walk. I'm going to go smoke a blunt, you know, very, very casually. And that's who I see walking down. I see Malone. I'm like, hey, what's up, man? How you doing? I wasn't nothing much. She's like, hey, we're starting a new band. Really? It's like, what kind of band? It's like a hardcore band. Beat down. I'm like, ooh. Say, you want to try to sing? I was like, uh, can I sing in Spanish? I was like, yeah. We had two practices. I think after the first practice, I fell in love. I was like, yeah. Now the hard part to call Barry. I was working at a warehouse at that time. I remember. And I was telling the, the warehouse guys where to put the pallets at. You know, just sure. Put this one here, put that one there. And I remember getting a text. At that time, it was one of those, uh, wasn't a phone, it was one of those text phones where you just received texts. Oh, okay, okay. And it was Glenn saying, you got to tell the guys. And it was just constantly on me that day. And I <sighs> picked up the phone, put a quarter in the machine. Yes, you had to put quarters in the machine to call. <laughs> and I called Barry. I was like, Barry? And I just started sobbing. He was like, yo, bro, what the fuck is wrong with you? Everything okay? I'm, I'm going to join another band. He goes, oh, dude, nah, it's cool. Don't worry. I'm so sorry. And I just kept crying and just apologizing to him. And, and then I joined Billy Club. <laughs> I'm an emotional guy. I don't know what to tell you. No, that's good. That's good. Uh, so, so what's what? What are some of the first songs that you um, remember from Billy Club? Abuso. Uh huh. Uh, Preacher's daughter, the pimp's wife. Yep. Uh, shit. Uh, a song that we forgot the lyrics for. Which well, that was later on. Loose lips. Yeah. Loose lips. That's what you, you had. Well, from that first demo, there was Learn also. That's right. The, with the Scoppy. That's right. That's no, right. The DEA was. DEA was the one with the Scoppy. Damn. Right. Now you know why I needed money. Yeah. <laughs> That's going to save me Learn, saying a lot. Learn is the one song that Billy Club never played since I joined. Mm. Ah. Wow. That's right. So were you were you writing all the lyrics to Billy Club's songs? No, I had a hard time transitioning from deathcore to hardcore. Now yeah. I, you know, now I had to okay, there's no more of, you know, go fuck yourself God and all that shit. Now is society, community. Uh, now you gotta write lyrics. <laughs> and now I gotta write lyrics. You can't just go to Mentis. Right, know. right. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. <laughs> Fuck your teacher. 
<laughs> property. <laughs> Um, you know, and so Malone jumped in, and ever since it's always been me and Malone. Okay, always writing all the lyrics. I see, I see. Some songs just took longer. Some songs were just twenty minutes. Yeah, you know, yeah. depending on the situation, depending on the topic. You know, it, it just took pretty much longer. You know, this "Slow with Your Hands" was very. It took a long time to write "Slow with Your Hands." Chen music. Or maybe a day. Yeah, sure, you know, sure. Especially the way how we would, me and Malone was feeling. Yeah, know? sure, sure. So, you know, again, depending on which songs, what songs, and how we structured it, you know, we wrote it. Yeah. Between Malone and I. Um, so, I want to ask you some more about, you know, the process of writing songs and all in a little bit. But before we get to that, just to stick with the early period of Billy Club, do you remember the first show that Billy Club played? And where and how that went? Wetlands. We played Wetlands. I guess Glenn had the big uh, connection with everybody. We played a Gnostic Front's return it show. Was, yes. It was uh, Mad Hall, and then Agnostic Front was a surprise. Right. Wow. Right. Okay. And if I'm if I'm and if I'm correct, please correct me. Rabies was still living. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Rabies was still living. So I do remember that first show because Rabies was. To me, Ravi was my mentor. I was, yeah, I was going to ask you about He was my mentor. He was somebody that I fucking go to every fucking time. Like, every time I go to a show, he was always there. And it would just always be me and him having a conversation. Hey, wow. give me a second. I'll be right back. And he'll come back and continue the conversation. Yeah. But he was somebody that I really looked up to. And by the way, I mentioned it before when we did our interview. Rabies at that Lala Palooza show we talked about. Rabies was working. Was working there too. That's oh. right. That's right. That's right. Wow. Damn, dude. You really don't smoke weed. <laughs> <laughs> Can't say that because listen, Glenn smokes more than most of us, and his memory is true. True. He's just more functional than the rest of us. But yeah, I remember that show. I remember the shirt that I had, which was something that. The fellas were snapping on me for many, many years. It was a, just a weird shirt with a zodiac sign of the Sagittarius. Okay, okay. Black shorts, black sneakers, and I and a chain down my on the side. Chain wallet? Yeah, the chain wallet. Yeah. And I remember performing. But then I remember getting off stage, sitting at the bar, getting a drink. And having this, at the time, I think he was a record producer or something in the record uh, industry. Yeah. But he was drunk. <sighs> that brown guy there was just fucking phenomenal. Brown guy? What, what, what? He looked just like he was on stage, just like singing in Spanish. I don't know what the fuck. But man, that music was hard. At that point, by the time we went to our next practice, I kept telling the guys, hey, man, we got to come up with something. that w They will not remember the name, but they will remember the fucking singer. Yeah, yeah. And that's how the Charlie Brown shirt came about. Ah, I see. Well, I see. But you didn't actually do that until later. Right, like, right. But I was trying to figure out. Yeah, I was trying to talk yeah. stuff. So what, before you got to the Charlie Brown shirt, what are some of the other things that you were trying out? Oh. <sighs> Fred Flintstone. Fred Flintstone, yep. But I ain't like my feet. Uh, <laughs> there, there's uh, a Fat Albert shirt, I think, right? There was a Fat Albert shirt at one point that I before. wanted to only wear his uh, his sweater. <laughs> and then the last idea I had that I tried to really was Chespirito, which is the Spanish version of a comedian beat. And he would have one of those bong... Uh, Oh yes. <laughs> so I couldn't use that either. I, even though I wanted to, but there was no shirt at that time. There was uh, nothing to represent uh, him. Right. Yeah. Right. As a, an image. Yeah. So. With, uh, how how did you get a Charlie Brown shirt? How do I get? How do I got a Charlie Brown shirt? Well, once I made the decision, I think I went to, and I still have the fucking shirt at home. The original one, huh? Yeah, the first original shirt. Wow. And it was an actual Charlie Brown shirt. With okay. It like that. I see, I see. Somebody, t my kid's mom, took me to 
Great Adventures for the first time. Ah. And in Great Adventures, you know, you have all the merchandise and everything. And then that's what I saw. I said, whoa, I may need to get this. And that, that was it. I was like, hey, guys, is you guys all right? Yeah, we're fine with it. I should hold the Billy Club on stage. Yeah, then do that too. And here we are. <laughs> um, and the first time you wore the Charlie Brown shirt, your premiere of the Charlie Brown shirt, do you remember the venue that that was at? Hmm. No. Glenn, Glenn will remember. I don't remember either. Because I, I honestly don't remember if it happened right before or right after I joined. But it was, no, it was, it was way before. It was before? It was before. Oh, okay. Because Matt Stevens was still in the back. Matt it was Stevens way was before, yep. And was the Christmas tree, was that... Was that shortly <laughs> around the time you started wearing the Charlie Brown shirt, or after? Where the Christmas tree? No, that that was before the okay. Christmas tree. Oh, that was before that was Castle Heights. That, that was Castle Heights. That, that, that was no redeeming right. social value for adding on to the expectation of uh, Charlie Brown Christmas special. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I remember, I remember, I had a, a, a type of club. I think it was my father. My father. He did something with wood. Okay. And he made this wood so fucking tough, and I was banging on stage, and it broke. <laughs> and I was complaining how I broke my billy club. I have no 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 stick, no billy club in my hand. Like this is that was cool. before we carried a bag full of them to show. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I think it was Dean. Yeah, it was Definitely. Dean. Hold on, hold Definitely. on, and it was hold. in December. That's right. Uh -huh. yeah. So on the way to the show, those guys just decided to Get a buy tree. a Christmas tree off the street and brought it to the show. And they just handed it to me, and that became my club for the night. <laughs> 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 what it looked like at the end of the night, the tree that it had. It, it, it did not last long. <laughs> Maybe at the end of the set. <laughs> I was not in the band at that point, but I'm pretty sure I was at that show. Oh, yeah, you, yeah, you were at that, that show, and yeah, it didn't last <laughs> Wow. Um, so before we get into more shows and, you know, more of the songwriting process and all that, let's talk, um, you know, recording with Billy Club. The first recording, how that experience was for you. That was an amazing experience. I thought I was uh, Liberace and Prince. <laughs> I thought I was, I was expecting like this big thing where I sit down and this, the whole huge thing and just rose petals all over the place and it was totally not that. <laughs> um, it was a great experience. It really put me to the point where how I use a lot of my ideas now, especially with my new band. Oh, okay. That really helped me out a lot. That really made me grow as a musician. It made me feel tighter with my bandmates. Yeah. You know? Do you remember where it was? Yeah, Glenn's Basement. No? Well, the first demo was at NYU. That's right. The second time we recorded, we used AJ. That was Superheroes. That was later. That was later. See. But the, the demo, the first demo was at NYU because I ran into you guys at McDonald's because I was working at Tower Records. Shit. You're right. Glenn was in a, Glenn, a class Glenn, there. But yes, Glenn was going to NYU. <coughs> you guys recorded the demo. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yep, I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> I, think I think you may have done stuff in the basement also. I don't know. I was yeah. in the band back then, but I remember. Yeah, we were. I remember when you guys recorded the demo because I ran into you at McDonald's. Hmm. Shit. I don't remember if you were there. I know Malone and Glenn, Glenn. were there. Gotcha. At McDonald's because I was going to get lunch and going back to work. Oh. Oh. Damn. Had, oh, there you go. Had had you recorded with Godomentis on on anything? It was did I? I don't think we did. Oh, okay. I, I think see. it was most, mostly was just live performances. I see, I see, yeah. I see. Not till after you left. I mm -hmm. guess they started recording, right? Right. Um I see, I see, I there see. There was a there was a demo, I think, but I don't remember if you guys just recorded live or what. In somebody's basement, or yeah. so, I think it was in Frankie's uh, apartment at the time. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's right. The nine, maybe ninety three dip. Yeah, yeah. Because if like I that. remember correctly, we. Yeah, yeah. No, no. It was definitely in Frankie's apartment. We did the drums there. We well, 
we played together because we couldn't put, you know, we couldn't have, separate everything. Right, we couldn't separate everything. So, yeah, we did together. Yeah, 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 yeah sure. absolutely right. Sure. Wow. Um, and how did the recording process uh, evolve over time as far as, you know, the professional? How did it evolve? Well, Glenn's an asshole, so <laughs> <laughs> with him being there, that, that helped out a lot. Even he though he evolved as an asshole. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, it, it was a lot of Glenn's uh, coaching. Okay. Coaching, a lot of Glenn's coaching. And then when Muttley joined the band, he really upped it up a lot more. Yeah. I mean, not saying that Malone didn't have a part with it. Of course not. Uh, but Muttley really uh, brought up being more professional and learning how to breathe yeah. in certain parts of the song. So instead of just doing maybe two sentences, pause, you know, let the, the, the track go and then go on about it, he helped me understand how to breathe better and continue singing. Uh, so there was, were there parts that they had to cut and continue? Yeah, yeah sure, but it wasn't sure. as part of some, you know, another singer doing first line, yeah. stop, going back, doing second line, stop. So, you know, he really, really helped us out a lot. Wow. What, what about the skits on the recordings? You want to talk some about the... the that's all Glenn. That. That's all Glenn and Malone. Yeah. That's, that's all them. Uh, uh, I guess Glenn already had the idea, like, for example, uh, Body Cavity Search. Yeah, sure, sure. Apart sure. from uh, Police Academy. Uh -huh. uh, I remember that there was a demo that we did and one of their old friends or ex-friends was snitching on a cop and they had a, a an actual tape from it with the yeah, guy that snitching. The, that was the beginning of the demo. Right. But yes. Oh, that's right. That's right. Oh. And I don't even know. I don't remember what the connection was if it was one of their friends or what. But that, yeah, that was the beginning of one of the demos. Right. Uh -huh. So, yeah, that's always that Glenn and Malone's like, idea. Okay. Of, you and at that time, that. I mean, any idea I had with just sucks or was just gay. That's, <laughs> that's, that's what they say. Huh? That, that's what they say, exactly. Exactly, you know. So. Uh, wow. Um, so, do you want to talk more about um, about Muttley joining up with Billy Club? And you, you mentioned it a little with the recording process, but just in general, uh, how that came well, to be. Well, be before that, yeah. how did things go... That, that earlier version because you had Rod. You had Rod on, on guitar. You, you had the two lineups there because you had Rod on guitar and Malone on bass. And then you had the switch where Rod left and then Malone switched over to guitar and Matt Stevens uh -huh. played bass. So talk a little about that, the, those, those two versions of the band. So I want to say we... we I couldn't say that we got harder or or it kind of leveled out in a way. It kind of leveled out in a way. Uh, Rob was very, very good at guitar playing, but Malone had a lot to do with, you know, coming up with the with the song or the riffs. Yeah. And then when that transaction happened, it felt like Malone was Captain Malone. Like uh, he see. took control of how we should sound, how this should be played. Steven would do his part, but no, 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 no. Do it this way. Uh -huh. Or do it that way, you know. Um, not that it was difficult with Matt Stevens, unless he didn't stop drinking. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it, it, was, uh, it, 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 was, it, was, it was a good balance. But when he joined the band, it just went, it went straight up. Uh, his technicality, his ideas, uh, the knowledge of music that Muttley has, his knowledge of working in the record deal, in the record uh, business, you know, uh, sure. all of that just really amped us up. So that really helped a lot. I it see. Definitely evolved. I see. I'm going to uh, ask you about one more thing. Do you remember the Lion's Den show? Lion's Den. What embarrassing shit did I do? <laughs> You showed up Crazy Lee. That was the show that I booked before I was in the band. Yeah, I don't remember. Of course not. Like everybody else was freaking out while you just walked in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> 
That was the show that you showed up crazy late, like after the time that the band was supposed to play. Mm -hmm. And I booked the show, and I was yelling and screaming at everybody. And then you finally showed up, and they had to play with like my band's instruments. Like I was like, you don't even have time to tune up your shit. <laughs> And it's funny that you don't remember that, and now you're going to catch a lot of shit. <laughs> yeah, I brought a little phone. Everybody else was like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. Because it was before cell phones, so it's like, well, I don't know where it is. We can't reach it. <laughs> 22 I, I years tried to hit his cage, and we're like, he's not calling. So, like, well, who's he going to call? Like, when he shows up, he shows up. Yeah, that's true. But then I still joined the band anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so talk more about, um, the songwriting process and some of the things that you were, you know, drawn to lyrically, um, and, you know, what inspired you with some of the, the lyrics that you ended up writing? Well, I got to start with the, with the first demo, Abuso. Abuso was a song about, you know, uh, how we were against, uh, women and children being abused. Sure. Uh, especially in the community and the area that I lived in. I see that all the time. And, uh, you know, my personal experience of me being abused just really put that on top of uh, the inspiration of writing that song. Sure. Uh, another perfect song is, uh, you know, chin music, you know, yeah. me and Malone, you know, at that time, I, my dad already passed maybe 13, 14 years, and then Malone just recently had his father pass. And, you know, everybody already has their experience of losing someone important. Whether they can still grief after a certain amount of time and be okay with it, or still have that pain after many decades. And, you know, I felt the same way with Malone when we wrote that song and less than a day. Yeah. And, you know, that kind of inspired me. You know, even when before Billy Club went down to their hiatus and we stopped playing for a while, we did me and this guy, we was already started writing a couple of songs. I started uh, writing a song called Never Again. And uh, that was my experience of being raped when I was young. Yeah. And so, you know, using that type of platform with that song, I wanted to really reach out to more people who actually had that experience. Yeah. Because, you know, when you're going to see a big tough guy say all oh, this shit that I just said, you're not going to see that shit unless they are very comfortable. Absolutely. On not only helping themselves, but helping everybody else who has gone through it. So those are good, good examples of what it will push me to write other songs. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't know if if you remember this, but Malone mentioned, you know, in relation to chin music, when you all went to Puerto Rico, I guess the first time you all went to Puerto Rico, it wasn't too long after, after chin music came out. Mm -hmm. And there, there, you know, was a kid in the audience who like told him how much that song meant to him at all. Um, I mean, we get that a lot. We get yeah. that a lot. We get that a lot. You know, the, uh, just recently at the FYA Fest, I went there to support Pain of Truth and EGH and all the other bands, but you know, those were the two uh, main bands I went to see. And I had this guy, this young kid, you know, he, he approached me and he, you know, he said how much he liked the band and everything, but he really emphasized on chin music. Yeah. He said that music, uh, that song really helped him move forward to his grieving to his uh, situation where he couldn't move forward. Yeah. And to get, you know, to take a moment of his, of my time, of him explaining how he was able to move forward because of the song, you know, that, that really touched me. Yeah. So I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, it's, it's interesting because a lot of times, especially people who might not listen to heavier music, just assume it's all, you know, angry stuff. I'm going to, you know, beat your ass blah and there you know there's there's obviously plenty of that you can find but it's it's interesting because it, you know your songs deal with such raw things sometimes and why don't you talk some about the experience as um as a singer singing these songs what it is that you're feeling when you're singing them i mean you know uh 
Uh, I'll go back to gym music. There has been a point in time that it took me almost two years, three years to sing that song without part. Yeah. Uh, you know, certain parts of the song just really hits you. Yeah. Um, every time I do sing that song, I think about me and Malone writing and just pretty much almost embracing each other while we're writing because yeah. of how we still feel. It. Yeah. So that, that that's a good part of that, you know. Um, another same uh, example like I gave before, you know. There was a point in time where, you know, me and a good friend of mine saw this one person getting beat the fuck up. And we joined and we fucking beat the crap out of the husband or the boyfriend uh -huh. or whatever. Uh -huh. But weeks later, they're back together again. Yep. You know, so this is just little prime examples of how, how we use uh, our everyday life into certain songs. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm going to ask you about a different and, and this will spin into something that's a little different that we haven't really talked about too much except when you talked about living in the project. What do you remember about the Justice Unknown? Mm. Just that was an incident that turned into a song. That's right. Uh, it was EGH, it was us. Another New York band, we was playing Long Island. Yes. I was okay. playing Long Island. And uh, while I was playing, there was, uh, I guess, you know, somebody who just didn't like someone singing in Spanish in their mm -hmm. genre of music. Mm -hmm. So he was talking shit. And by the time we got on stage, Robbie GH was like, yo, this guy was talking shit. I was like, let's go fuck this dude up. And as we went there, now, this is the time when the cell phones started coming out. Yeah. <clears throat> Everybody's cell phone was out. And we're about to beat the shit out of this dude. <laughs> and it was only the dude, the singer of uh, Justice Unknown, and whatever girlfriend that he was with at the time was in the car. We was about to destroy that car. That was, that was the very beginning of cell phones. So there weren't a lot of them around. And I wasn't there. But I, there is video, and it's not cell phone video, because that definitely was not cell phone. No, no, right, video. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, that by that time, those guys left, and you know, this music came up. And I think, if, if I'm not mistaken, it was Malone who was like, "Yo, we should write about these motherfuckers." I'm yeah. like, Fuck. And, and by the way, my understanding is what he said specifically was like, "Why does this guy fucking speak English?" Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. So, uh -huh. so it was some kind of like jerk off racist shit. Yeah, mm -hmm. yep, yep. And that's how the song was born. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Were Were there any other Hardcore bands in New York at the time that were singing songs in Spanish and in English like you all were. You know what? No, not, not that so. I remember. You know, um, even when the first time we went to Puerto Rico, to this day, I still have people telling me that we were the first band to do that. Yeah. I, I don't believe I... Like, Manuel did a Spanish version of one of their songs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mi Familia. Yeah, yeah. well, he... They did a Spanish version of Pride. That correct. And they also did, I forget if it was one song that was half Spanish, but that was much later. That was way much later. Yeah, that was way later. Way later than that, yeah. But uh, I, I don't, uh, I can't recall really much of when we just started doing that. But Bob I answered the states at least. Like you, you had Puerto Rico bands. Yeah, sure. Puerto well, Rican that's another like, thing because a lot of the Puerto Rican bands were singing in English. Yeah, 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 yeah that's right. So if you go to South America, whether it's Mexico, Colombia, or Venezuela, you know they will still sing in English. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, just like Sepultura. Um, that exactly yeah. per perfect example. And I, you know, as as a person living in the Bronx and bilingual uh, family, you know, I was like, mm -hmm. you know. We could reach out to more people singing both languages. Absolutely. And, you know, that's how that came about. But that was one of the best, uh, one of the things that I, I do remember on that one. Yeah. Did you ever run into any other racists? Like, like obviously, like when you talk about growing up in the projects and shit like that, but in any time, whether it was going to Mentis or, or Building Club or, or any other not, time, like now you just... Going now, to do something on your own. You now we go to Mentis. Now we go to Mentis because go to go to Mentis. We stood in our circle. We yeah. stood in the Bronx. We stood in New York City. You know, it was already diverse. With Billy Club, Billy Club was going all over the place. You know, Syracuse. You know, ain't nobody speaks Spanish there at that time. That's how we we did. Yeah, sure. You know, um, 
There, there was another racist. Uh, I only recall one time, which was nothing like nothing actually happened, but I remember the white power dudes that were up in like Hilltop when we played next to the fairgrounds that when we played like that parking lot. What Aqua thought wasn't no, that the? I don't remember who else played. I don't think it, it wasn't Aqua thought, but it was just like there were a couple of white power dudes just like. In the mix at the show, I don't we were keeping an eye on. And wait, I don't remember that, but I do remember us playing CBs and Malone came out with a chair. And beat the fuck well, that was yeah, oh, that was that's definitely right. racist. Thing. That's right. That, he that he was, told yeah. that story. Yeah, yeah and then yeah, yeah. once he was done, yeah, we told that story because that that was that was the dude's girlfriend that was just like throwing out end bombs. Right, 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 right. Wow. You know, yeah. throw, throwing out in bombs to call people spits and all of a sudden it was just like, oh, okay. So yeah, wow. that, those are the two yeah. top ones that I do remember. Could other has happened? Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, I sure, could sure, only sure. imagine, you know. Sure. But you know, when certain people just talk to themselves and just talk with whoever they're in, we're not gonna definitely hear anything. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. It is what it is. I think Molly, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think weren't there some white power uh, idiots who showed up at the Pelham Parkway. Um, uh, I don't know if they were white power. We thought they oh, were. We, okay. we, we like it was questionable. Like they may have just been blockheads. I think they may have been from like Silver Beach or something. I forget. Somewhere. <laughs> <down there. laughs> yeah. So Silver you know, Beach. Do you remember this uh, Club sixteen eighty on Pelham Parkway? When Ernie, when those dudes tried to jump Ernie, and we all stepped off the stage. Oh my God! That was <laughs> oh my God! It, 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 we did not even hesitate. Nope. It was just like all, 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 all four, all four, uh, just walking right off. Down, just <laughs> and y'all, y'all are all big guys too. <laughs> oh yeah, the whole place was just like <laughs> that. That place was owned it was was like an extension of Music Unlimited. I know not the guy, the guy right. who owned Music Unlimited was the one who booked the shows. There. I see, I see, I see, I see. That's what it was. Wow. Um, and. And you all played, of course, at the at the at Blackthorn too, right? Oh shit! Yeah, uh, yeah. Wow. How, how was that? Uh, sounded shitty, but you know, <laughs> it, it sounded very shitty. But <laughs> yeah, I, I do remember the the sound there. But we always packed up the house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and we pretty much pretty much destroyed it. And I'm sure that the kids. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> probably I mean, not. I, I, no, no, no. Remember. Uh, we, Walked a lot of people to the ATM machine, so uh, <laughs> I, 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 I think we I, did. I'll be shocked if that's the case. I think you got a mistake on something else. Yeah, wow! I, I know we did. Um, what other bands, you know, that were either from the Bronx or had Bronx, you know, members in them, even if the entire band wasn't from the Bronx? But what other bands uh, that were associated with the Bronx were you all closest with? Close call. Close call. Uh, Fahrenheit, especially. Yeah. Well, pretty much both guys were yeah, each yeah, other band. Exactly, so. exactly. Um, damn, who else can we? Especially, I mean, not back in the day. Oh, yeah, your band, too. No, right? no, no. Oh, I rate. Yeah, yeah. I rate. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I rate. <laughs> yeah, I rate is one of them. But, sure. I mean, it was, I want to say that. Uh, Close call in Fahrenheit was it came like that and then I rate slowly and well those things were that was that was a little early because it was without a cause that turned into Fahrenheit right but then I rate was in the mix later on because like we talked about before where like first you like look at each other like funny and then all of a sudden everybody's friends yeah pretty much but, uh, Steve. Yeah, yeah, that, oh shit, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Damn, bro. Yeah, I need to stop smoking or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, fuck. Well, speaking of the Fahrenheit, guys, this is a, a question that might or might not apply to you, but, you know, a lot of them used to hang out at Bronin's. Um, you obviously didn't play an instrument, but did you hang out at any music stores? To just hang out to go see Frank. Yeah, okay, okay. That, I see. that will be the only, and then that, that you know, seeing Frank. And, you know, seeing, you know, I mean, I guess everybody's different, especially the way we grew up. And, you know, some of the for our friends were just pieces of shit and just scumbags. Yeah. You know, I, I'm not being, uh, 
uh, not trying to be uh, what's the word I'm trying to fucking use uh, conceited or not, but you know I'm always polite and you know thank you, you know and hello. And, and as going there to see Frank, I would you know be really cool with the owner, and then the owner started really really trusting me. And, hey, just make yourself at home, and, and it was always like that. I would come out of school, take the bus. Get off in Ford and Road, walk down the fucking Dead Man's Hill, and just hang out with Frank all the time. Wow, okay. So that was something that was very... And then that's when I met uh, Chucky. Oh, Chucky. you met Chucky there, too. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah Chucky, yeah. I met that motherfucker here for a long time. I mean, I've known him for shit. Well, he was around in Bond Street days, too. Yeah, yep. 20 some odd years. Yeah. Oh. Around, yeah. Uh, and what, what about... You know, stores to buy music. Uh, were there stores in the Bronx that you would go to? No, Chucky would take me to a store somewhere in Yonkers. We would take three buses just to go take <laughs> just to go to was this Rock and Rex. Yes, Rock and Rex. Yes, uh, that's okay. when uh, John and Aqua Thought was working yeah, there yeah. at one point. Okay, yeah. uh, Bleaker Bob's, and Bleak Bob's, there's yeah. one more in the Village Generation. Thank you. Ah, uh, that, so that's. But there were also because you and I used to go to other places in, in the village also that are no longer there. There used to be a lot of. Them. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Now it's like, but those are yeah. my top threes that came. Yeah, in, straight to mind. The the place in Yonkers, that's the place where there would sometimes be shows, right? Yeah, right. yes, yes. yeah. Because I think we talked about it in the Billy Club one that like AFI played there in the early days. <laughs> uh, John Walker thought's old band. Uh, I forgot their name all of a sudden. But it, it, John used to work there. Uh, a lot of bands used to play there. Yeah, yeah. But it was it was in the very early days, so it was like before Billy Club started. Yeah, sure. Long before I rated or Billy Club or even Far like without a cause was around, but I don't think they ever played there. But like that was the very that was like very early early nineties. Yeah. Early nineties, yeah, 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 yeah. Um so so going going back to Billy Club, just wanted to get a little of that in. Um why don't you talk about, you know, touring some, both, you know, outside of New York and the kind of, you know, like a little beyond the tri-state area and, you know, Puerto Rico, the first Puerto Rican tour. That that was just amazing. All friends, all close friends yeah. touring. It was pretty much a weekend getaway, man. That was one of the best places Every band kicked ass. Every, I mean, there were a lot of Puerto Rican girls would just, <laughs> they would just fucking, and they would join in into the fucking pit, but they would come down with one knee and just cock punch everybody. Like, it was, <laughs> it, was it was very, vi it was a violent, fun fucking show. Wow. One of the best places that we've ever, I want to say, one of the best places we've Played except, see what right there. Besides London, besides the so especially much. Japan. Japan, I know, I know. There's Oof. a lot there. Japan uh, was one of my favorites, you know. Wow. But yeah, those, those Puerto Rico was a was one of the it was the New York invasion. Yes. Yeah. Because I rate was there too, right? I rates one enemy, E G H, us and that was it. You had a couple of Puerto Rico bands. Yeah, local bands. Nice. Four of them. You really need more than that. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's that's when you all were staying in like this hotel, or like motel that was like the, uh, uh, a long way yeah, the, outside of anything. It right? was one of those, uh, you can't school one fucking hotel. Because <laughs> you go in and there's a door and you press the button and the, and the, the door garage. opens and it's a garage. And when you put your car in, Right inside the garage, there's a door that goes right into the hotel. I'm like, oh shit! <laughs> <laughs> oh, the stories I was in there. I mean, even little uh, No Neck Paulie was just swimming in the fucking jacuzzi with oh, his clothes God. on, uh, he was drinking out of the bidet. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh <that's the> <laughs> but I gotta ask you about something serious when it comes to that Puerto Rico trip because that Puerto Rico trip started on a very bad note. And I, I would assume the Golden Mantis guys talked about this too, but uh, you remember when we were at the airport and the news we got? Oh, yep. Milton. Milton, yeah. Milton passed, yeah. Oh, that's when we, we were in the airport. Martin got the call when we were in the airport. Oh, wow. Actually, 
I'm sorry, our flight, we, did it happen before we left the first time or after? No, after. Exactly. We left, we took off, Yeah. and then we landed because something was wrong with the plane. And while we were there waiting, that's when the call came about no. Wow. Was that was tough. That was very tough. Wow. Um, that, that made that trip a little harder. Yeah. But we'll talk about that one. Yeah, no, I mean, it was, it was, I'm an emotional person, so I'll cry in front of five people, 10,000 people, I don't give a fuck. Yeah, sure. You know, but uh, the militant situation, I had to really put myself to the side because first time that we went to Puerto Rico, you know, I didn't want to fuck up and shit like that, you know, but uh, getting off the plane and going straight to, you know, calling Barry like that just, it, it, it was hard, but it, it sucked, it sucked. Want to tell exactly what happened? Uh, yeah, we only, one of the so-called friends tried to... It was somebody that he trained. Well, pretty much was a good friend of his and after a certain amount of time. He was, he was a security guard for a uh, yeah. truck place and uh, armor cars. Armor cars, right. They were transporting and they just, they jacked him up. Right? They jacked him up and they, they murdered him. So, damn. Pretty much sucked, man. It, it, it really hit his heart. Uh, hit me hard emotionally, like, I didn't even want to continue playing yeah. after a while, yeah. but, you know. With us as, uh, even though I wasn't in the band at the time, but still, I would say us, because we all felt it. And, well, we all knew him in the French. Right. So, we had gone, just from go to mental shows, we knew Milt and hung out with him many times, so that was... And then they just thinking about his parents because his parents are so fucking cool and, and his brothers and sisters. Like, it, it, it was just a mess, man. It was a mess. And it, was, it was hard to move forward from that. Yeah. Yeah. Very hard to move forward from that. Was he, was he the first person from at least the Bronx scene um, to pass? I mean, I, I know. There was a couple. There was couple. Even before him, there was a couple. But, you know, with all due respect, I don't like talking ill about the dead, but, you know. They were drug addicts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sure, I, sure, I really sure. don't want to, you know, elaborate more into that, but yeah, they just they were drug addicts, and it's not like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. You know, that was it. Not it, like it was, it was tough, but that one was real tough because yeah. he was a nice dude, very sweet, yep. sweet humbled. Even the fan, the whole family's still sweet to this day. Yeah. So yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um. So before um before the Puerto Rico trip, where was the furthest away that you all had played before then? I mean, I know you all were playing all around the New York City area, upstate and all. Upstate would have been the furthest. Upstate, yeah. I see. Upstate of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania? Yeah, yeah, true, true. Yeah. Pennsylvania too. Yeah. Um, and you you mentioned it a little bit, like in, in Syracuse, like, you know, people not being used to hearing you sing in Spanish, but what was it like? Traveling outside of the New York City area, the Puerto Rico trip is a you know different thing, of course. But like Pennsylvania, upstate. I mean, it was cool. I mean, in Pennsylvania, there was at in the beginning there was just people knew our stuff, but nobody would move. Yeah. So I felt a little, you know, like if somebody had uh, not somebody, excuse me, like a group of people had problems with me singing in Spanish. Nobody would move. The next band after us would be fucking whack as fuck and everybody's uh -huh. moving going crazy I'm like, yeah really um uh syracuse that that was that was a great experience okay. uh you know we was very we was going out with pink truth no right hang man, hang man hang at, the at the time but also the thing with the english like you were talking about the spanish was perceptions not necessarily reality like we were traveling you would think nobody Right. You think you get a weird reaction. I think that's what Mark was saying before. And it wasn't necessarily like, I don't want to bury Syracuse. Cause that was oh, okay, sure. okay, yeah, yeah. yeah sure, it, was sure, just, sure. it was just the idea, the perception of, like, we travel to these different places and, like, maybe they're not going to, like, know Spanish or speak Spanish or like sure. Spanish and start saying some stupid shit or something. But I see, I see. Yeah, I see. Was, yeah. We never ran into that. Yeah. It was just a perception I see. that yeah. you have yeah. at the time. Sure. And I want to, you know, elaborate a little bit more on the Syracuse show because I really, you know, it was a little bit of people, you know, it was the locals, and I just, it's like, oh, man, this is going to suck. And right before I went on stage, I think about 12 or 13 people 
got yellow shirts and took a black marker and did the <laughs> Charlie Trump Brown emblem that made me wow, fucking happy. Wow, that's amazing. And that was, was that was great. Yeah, because you didn't even realize it at first. I'm sitting at the merchandise and I'm looking. I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> and that's I'm, cool. Mark, Mark, come here. Look. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> that really blew me yeah. away and it took a picture with them, you know. And yeah, I still have those pictures. I'm showing them somebody a couple, like within the past couple of weeks, they were telling that story and showed the pictures to somebody. So it, it was it was a great uh, experience. And that, was, that really, it, just like Mully said, it took my perspective right out of the window. Like, yeah. I was like, wow, I did not expect this. Wow. So it was pretty yeah. awesome. 13 people, yellow shirts. Yeah, like, it was really so cool. cool. Everybody just was just like, like pretty much welcome. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So that was cool. Wow, that's really cool. Um, so, so why don't you talk about some of your other tours that you went on and, and how how those were like? In Japan. I'm going to talk about Japan because uh, my son is uh, an anime lover, and uh, that's all we spoke about. Me and him, and we're we're into anime and cartoons and toys, uh-huh. and it was. It wasn't. It was a red carpet for us. Like yeah. They put out pretty much the red carpet everywhere we went, especially me and him. They thought we were fucking wrestlers. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody was this small, you know. Everywhere, you know, when there's a lot of crowd. We saw everything clearly because nobody was over us. <laughs> um, it, the food was fucking phenomenal. I I, oh, I'm allergic God. to shellfish, and I ate. Every fucking selfish <laughs> possible. And not one itch, one scratch, one hive, nothing. Um, six months before leaving, I started learning a little bit, you know, you know, where's the bathroom? Uh, where's my friend? You know, just little things here and there. Sure, sure, sure. Almost by the end of the tour, I would have little small conversations with the locals. You know, uh, one of our shows in Sanjuku... Long ass fucking line. Yeah, I went to the back of the line and just started hanging out with everybody one by one. Whoever didn't understand me, just go go next. next yes, yeah. next. I was there for almost two hours. Wow, something that I really enjoyed because again, you know, uh, uh, training with uh, Dijon and being in the mixed martial arts for so many years, like I even got more into the culture, just being happy to be there. Yeah. I would do it again very quickly. I would probably quit my job just for a two-week tour in Japan. Wow. I got to I gotta jump on here. Oh, yeah, yeah, jump quick on. Mark story. So. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. No, you're going to love this. You're going to love this. So, we're in Japan, and Martin is a little self-conscious about speaking Japanese. Because he's like, oh, they're laughing at me like this. And, and I just stopped and I look at Martin and I said, you're a big brown dude and you're speaking more Japanese than the rest of us combined <laughs> and you're doing it pretty well. So stop. You're fine. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, you're absolutely fucking right. Out. and we're like, dude, of course they're laughing because you're a big Dominican dude <laughs> in, in the middle of Tokyo <laughs> spitting out Japanese and, and actually sounding like... I'm like not I even trying I'm to sp- speak Japanese because I know I'm going to sound like a fucking idiot. <clears throat> you're sounding fine and you're all self-conscious about it. It's like, dude, you're good. Don't worry about it. <laughs> wait, hey, wait, where'd you pick up Japanese? Just on your own or Google. mixed martial arts? Oh. Google, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Google, baby. Google. Nice. Every, every little thing, I would say this and it would just say it for you. Yeah. No, on on stage, stage, too. Oh, yeah. On oh, stage because yeah. we're all just looking at each other. <laughs> He's got it. He's good. So, yeah, I really practice it. So, really when, when's the first Japanese Billy Club uh, song gonna come out? Oh. <laughs> One day, that's not today. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and you mentioned you mentioned London just in passing already. Um, you want to talk about uh, uh, about London? Well, London was awesome. Uh, meeting everybody over there from our team to every everybody from Knuckle Dust. Uh, what was the other band that kept making me drink vodka? I don't, I don't remember that. Who was? Oh no, you're thinking of Backfire. 
How? Holland. That's another another oh, band that I had. Oh, man. Yep, yep, yep. That was a rough night. It, it, and look, what's that fun? Was, I, I was in, uh, it was in Holland. What, what was the name of that place? Because we played there twice. Oh, God. I can't remember. Yeah. Don't remember. Don't remember. That was, yeah, because we were going to the ferry. That's right. When I, mm-hmm. I got snuck in into the country because well, of Pierre. The dudes from Backfire. Did a number on you, boy. Those dudes did a real number on you. I was throwing up. I had diarrhea. <laughs> oh, all fucked up. I wasn't presentable. And Glenn was like, hey, Pierre, could you just throw Martin into your work truck? Okay. And he just threw me into the work truck. I was there. Hammers falling. Wrenches falling. But we got to what we needed to get to. So that was good. Wait, wait, wait was London... Part of the European tour, I forget. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's... the whole the whole thing with this was. <laughs> hey, come on in! Come on in! Here we go again. All right. So so we play. It's the last day of the tour on the European continent. Then we're taking the ferry to go to to England to go to London. The backfire dudes get this dude hammered. Just. Feeding him, feeding him bottles, bottles, bottles. Uh, this was the second tour. We were touring with Onesta. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Onesta yeah. had a van and a car. These guys are like, hey, we want Martin to ride with us in the car. And we're like, go for it, buddy. Knowing what is coming. So Martin ends up like throwing up. Like we we're in the van and we get and one of those guys gets a call like we're at the next rest stop. Martin's really sick. Martin threw up on the side of the car. He's just <laughs> leaning on the wall. When we get there, he's leaning on a wall and just like <laughs> thanks to backfire. And then uh, backhand from Baltimore was supposed to play at the festival in London. Oh shit, that's right. Backhand. Got busted trying to come in with no work visa. Uh, so the money that would have been for backhand paid for Pierre to come with the ferry. Because our plan was they were going to drop us off and we were going to walk through with all of our equipment, which was guaranteed going to get us busted with no work visa. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, it just, this was not a, a good plan, but this is what we had. So it all worked. Like the universe looked out for us. <laughs> But then, like, we were also thinking, like, dude, if we got to walk through there with Martin in the state that he's in right now, we're, we're cooked. <laughs> so, sure enough, the universe worked its magic that, like, Martin rode in the van with them. We just walked through. So, they didn't see drunk-ass Martin. They didn't see all of our equipment because it was in the back of the work truck. And we just walked magically, right yeah. we went and went to London and played. Well, we were riding in the back of that work van like Martin was talking about and he hit a short stop at one point and all all the shit in the work van fell on top of him. <laughs> that somewhere, uh, Glenn has the photo because we we're like, yo, we got to take a picture of this and it's like, they open the back of the work van and it's all of us just like laid out with <laughs> stuff on top of us. But, but that was the story of that trip, the, I forgot to backfire got you all twisted. Destroyed. <laughs> twisted. Destroyed. That's backfire. So, so Martin, why don't you talk some about, you know, what you were thinking, you know, kid grew up at least primarily in the Bronx, and suddenly, you know, you're traveling around the world. I will only think that that would have happened if I would have uh, entered the, mili- the, the military. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. That's the only time that I would ever think not one moment will I ever think that I will go out of the country, forget out of the state, out of the country with this type of music. Yep. And playing in front of people like not even Puerto Rico would I have ever thought. Of course, yeah. You yeah, know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, from this point forward, it just it just it hyped me up. I I mean. I wasn't like Glenn style where the head got big and started flipping the door, but I was very appreciative. I was grateful every single time. Every time I saw Glenn and speak to him, yo, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Like, you know, it it just felt great. It it felt great. I mean, 
letting my mom know, hey, I'm going to Japan. Oh, you're going with that devil music. <laughs> you know, when we when we put out uh, 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 superheroes at leisure, and you know the the whole front of the CD is all you know cartoonish. Uh huh. Oh, so you're using Disney cartoon to reach this diabolical to the uh, to the youth? <laughs> I'm like, forget about it. Just forget it. But yeah, it was a great experience. And and in Japan, I think I remember Malone saying, "Yo, we're even in like you know, just the standard like music like magazines that you find at like gas stop, you know, gas stations." Uh, we like stopped at a, at a spot, and I hear Malone like, "Whoa, what the fuck!" And we're in the middle of a page, and we're just talking about Billy Club Sandwich being in Japan such and such time. You know, these like guys from New York. And that you did that interview with that one magazine. That's right. It turned out to be a big. That's right. Magazine. Then we yeah, went to uh, what's the name of the the record shop? Which one? The record shop that gave us all the shirts and all the stuff. Oh, that was uh, uh what's the name's place? Um, from uh. Creep up? No, uh, why am I forgetting the name? Of it? Sand. Sand. Sand, right, right. We went to one of his record shops. And the singer from Sand had a, had a shop and sold like clothing and stuff. Huh. And we just walked out of it. Like, we was just like, take this. But when we this. walked in, it was just like a huge thing of Billy Club at all. Oh, that was, no, that was Kazuki's record store. Oh, there you go. Wow. Because there, there was, uh, Makoto from Sand had, had a clothing Ooh. store. Right. And like, it's not like $20 t-shirts. It's like a couple hundred bucks for some of these t-shirts. Ah, yeah, yeah. like, take this, take this. But you're talking about Kazuki's record shop, which is where he had the big building club display and stuff like that. Well, our records are there. I mean, just seeing that happening, even when I was walking down Paris the first time and I recorded myself walking through Paris speaking in Spanish and that just... You know, somebody actually replied back to me, you know. There was a spot in London that was all Dominican spot. Yeah. With with the guy who just moved. We 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 was in Paris, I we, we stopped somewhere and I said something in Spanish and dude turned around and was like, Oh Turibano like uh, you in Spanish? I'm like, well, yeah, I'm from New York and we got into this long conversation, kinda of find out that he's a Dominican dude who came from the Dominican Republic. Went straight to London at that time and opened up his own Dominican shop. Spanish food. Wow. I don't know why we didn't go there. I know we got fucked up somehow. <laughs> yeah, whatever. But that, you know, it's just a good example. Yeah, of yeah, yeah. That we meet down the line. You know? Absolutely. Um, so, do you want to talk about the music video at all and, and how, <laughs> how that experience was? And... Oh, the music video. Yeah. It's it's for a song that Glenn Glenn has told me isn't very popular, which blows my mind because I get it stuck in my head for weeks and weeks, um, and relate very well to the uh, the the work aspect of things. <laughs> I was working at a job at, at a friend's uh, company. He opened up a litigation firm, and uh, that was a, one of my one of the best jobs that I had because, you know, I, I could wear a suit every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a zoot suit, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I would wear three-piece suits and, and you know, and uh, I pretty much worked as an administration. And, uh, you know, I, I asked my boss at the time, who's also still my very close friend. And I was like, yo, can we do a video here? Like, yeah, we can do a video here. He's like, God, just don't do this and don't do that. I'm like, okay. Well, uh, the video happened. Everything went well. I mean, it was very weird how, you know, we're, we're singing around in this long tube and, and you know, having, as I'm singing, walking down one of the corridors or one of the hallways, you have Glenn recording us while on a skateboard, having somebody push him back. Yeah, so no, no budget for dollars. <laughs> It was a great experience. It was a great experience, <laughs> but even greater seeing the numbers on YouTube just, just blah, 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 just yeah. up. That was really awesome. So, yeah, 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 yeah. I wish we made more. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, I wish we made more videos. Still time. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Um, so, 
Uh, before I ask about, you know, the, the first dissolution of, of Billy Club and, and all of that, um, Molly, do you have other questions you want to ask about, um, about Billy Club before we get there? Well, where are we now? We're, we're just kind of in general time frame. I was, I was just going to ask you about recording when it comes to like working with AJ, like you mentioned before, on superheroes. Oh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And then also talking about tune music, how different that recording was, because that was right around the time, if I recall correctly, that you had your son. Well, that was a good experience. I mean, working with AJ, I was kind of pretty much starstruck, you know. Yeah. Uh, I really didn't have much conversation with AJ, just just watching him work, just watching him, you know, all right, now do this, now do that, all right, don't, do, you know, and just, you know, watching him just do all the things. And, and we're talking about AJ Novello from Leeway, by the way, who produced Superheroes at Leeway. Right, and that, that's, again, it was a great experience. I, I, I was starstruck, I really didn't, say much besides thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, and then transitioning over to the chin music, I think it was more professional for me. Yeah. I think uh, I wanted to do better than what I did before. Oh, um, quick question for you. How hands-on was AJ as far as when it came to like the vocal performance stuff? Was he... Was he heavily involved, or, or was he just no, he wasn't, letting you do your thing? I think he was just letting me do my thing. It was okay. more with Glenn. It was more with Malone helping me out, uh, or helping, coaching me, in other words. Right. There wasn't much uh, AJ in uh, with the vocals, but with the guitars and, and the yeah, drums. Yeah, I know he was heavily involved. Well, in, one in that side. Yes, sir. Okay. So. But then Shin Music was different, you said. Shin Music, I, well, yeah, it was more different. It was more... Professional. It was more, you know, you know, had, doing superheroes with with AJ it was just like holy shit, holy shit, holy shit. Now I gotta take my time. I gotta focus. I gotta try to be better than what I did before. You know, so that that was the only difference that I see besides production. I think Glenn did a great job also in doing the production, taking his time, remixing the songs like what 30, 40 times at a time. You know, so you know. Big ups to Glenn for that one. And, and, and Motley was on Chin Muse. That was the first. Yes. Yes. 100%. Oh, and yeah. again, Motley was having him in, in the band just really upped up the production. Yeah. 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 Um, so what, what about the, the, the final recording that you all put out at that, at that time anyway? Usual Suspects. Usual Suspects. Hmm. That was fun, but also... Another learning curve, because more stuff that I've learned as I was trying to teach myself on the things that, for example, Jamie Josta was doing when he was singing. Uh, he would, from what I heard, he was going to a specific coach. And uh, that coach was putting a lot of videos on YouTube, and I was using a lot of what she was teaching. Was that and, Melissa Cross? That, thank you. Uh, wow, bro. Thank okay. you. Okay. I really got to stop smoking. Um, <laughs> but yes, uh, Melissa Cross had different channels in, uh, on YouTube, and I, I used a lot of it, and that really helped me, especially with uh, with the songs that we did. Didn't she I burn those on DVD for you or something? Yes, she did. Yes, yeah, she did. Yes, yeah, she did. I probably still have them. Uh, the Zen of Screaming was what we Yes, yes. Ah, okay. She's worked with a lot of big bands. Uh, Shadows Fall. She worked with Shadows Fall. She worked with Lamb God. She also worked with, like, Madball. Uh, H2O, like wide range of like metal and hardcore bands. Right. Oh, okay, okay. Wow. So that 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 really helped you at that time. So yeah, it helped you even more from the previous uh, record that we did. Wow. Um, so why don't you talk some about you know the about Billy Club? You know, stop stopping playing together at the time, and and eventually how you all got back together. Because hmm. we broke what was it was it? summer of 2010. But you can go back because we talked about it on ours that like things were brewing from like at least a year before that, that like things were getting weird. In, in, in what sense? Well, Just, Malone's been open about his issues and like 
some of the stuff that he was starting to fight, and then the friction between him. I mean, that, that, that was You weren't around as much, so it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't as prominent, but you were definitely in the mix. I mean, that was kind of rough. I mean, you, you guys would just always bump heads. Uh, it, it just felt to a point where there was no need for me to go to practice anymore. Yeah. You know, um, it was very difficult to enjoy the practicing or enjoy the songs that were playing, and all of a sudden they were getting into a situation where this riff sounds stupid. Well, that riff didn't sound stupid. It's, this sounds stupid. The whole back and forth thing, it, it, it really... There was a point in time where I didn't want to be in the band anymore. Yeah. Know, I just didn't want to, you know, uh, be part of the argument. Even even if they're like, hey, I, what do you think about that? Oh, I think Motley's idea was right. Oh, yeah, well, that's gay. So, you know, don't just keep moving. So it really didn't have much of a voice. Really didn't have much of a decision. If I did have a decision or, did I, or if I did vote on something, um, there were times when I would still feel very uh, pushed away from it. Damn, I fell all over me. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so you know those 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 moments of time with, with the band was very difficult. Yeah. So. Um. So after you all, you know, broke up, uh, were you? Did you play in any other? Or performing in any other bands? Yeah, I didn't. No, at that time frame, no, I didn't. Well, not. you when you moved to Baltimore. Oh, you moved to Baltimore for a little bit, huh? Shit, bro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now you know why Mutley's here. That's why you pay me the big bucks? <laughs> <laughs> I moved to Baltimore. Yeah, I remember. Shit. I remember driving to Baltimore before I drove. I was hoping that my guitars would pick up the phone. Yeah. And I was hoping that he would pick up the phone so I don't have to move to Baltimore. I was just wanting to say, you know what? I'm ready to play. Let's do it. Yeah. I would have turned my car around and drove back to the Bronx. Uh huh. But he never picked up the phone. He never called me back. Mm -hmm. So I moved to Baltimore, met someone, started a band called Ballistic. Uh, I, it, it started well, it started going very well. And, I guess life took its different toll where, you know, she didn't want to be with me and, you know, the band continued. We played a couple of shows, but we didn't even get to record anything. I see. So that ended that. And what, what kind of sound was ballistic? It was still hardcore, but I want to consider it a Baltimore hardcore. Ah, uh, okay, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, because everybody was from there and sure. they still had that stout sound, that yeah. stout feel, so. And you well, just added. there was a couple of people from other known Baltimore bands, right? Right, and, so, and, then, and it sucks because I will not. Rem I didn't want to bring that up because I will not remember the bands that they played. Oh, sure, sure, sure. That's fine. That's fine. How long were you in Baltimore? Three years, four years, about three years. Some okay, three, three or four years. Yeah, three or four years. Yeah. Uh, left out of there when I was with the person that I was with at the time. Yeah. Uh, after she left me, I think uh, somebody was was trying to drunk a girl or trying to drunk someone. Instead, I drank the drink. Oh man! Fucked me up, man. Wow. Fucked me up. I apparently uh, I threw a refrigerator out of my window. I I broke a my TV screen. I broke. I I did a lot of shit that I never thought I would ever do. Uh huh. So. Bad situation, bad time frame. Really didn't have really much support at that time. Yeah. I moved to Albany. Okay. Okay. And how long were you in Albany? I was in Albany for a good two and a half, almost three years. Okay. I see. Yeah. So mental mental health really fucked me up. Yeah. Uh, I was very close by it because of how I grew up. You know, there's no such thing as mental health in a Spanish family. Yeah, sure. So I kept myself closed. Uh, my sister let me stay with her. Uh, it took me almost a good seven or eight months to really pick myself up and get a job, find my own place. And then uh, little by little, Miller Club started coming back again. And then, got, you know, driving from Albany to uh, New York just to practice and then drive back. I didn't mind because yeah. it felt good. Yeah. You know, plus my head was back on straight. Yeah, sure. 
Do you remember the first show that you played when Billy Club got back together? First show. First show. Oh my God! The return of Billy Club Sandwich. Uh -huh. right. I had I changed the. I have a dude who I call him my nephew because he always respects me and looks to me like his uncle. And he had a Charlie Brown shirt that he did for me. Okay. And instead of being yellow shirt with black image, it was a black shirt with yellow. With the yellow shirt. Ah, shirt. okay. So we came back. Fuck, we came back hard. Yeah. I mean, I never seen, I personally never seen anyone run on top of a merchandise table and jump over. <laughs> <laughs> I never seen that. Uh, seeing my kids screaming, that, it, it was oh, amazing. Man. It was really amazing. So, was, was that the first show that your kid had been to? No, they've been going to shows since my daughter's 27 now and he. My son is 20. My daughter's been going to shows since she was six, wow. seven. Wow, okay, okay, okay. Every time I played a show, my kids were coming. Wow. Yeah, that was awesome. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really cool. One of the biggest uh, accomplishments that I made, did, was uh, we played Back to School Fest. Back to School Gym, yes. In, In Jersey. Jersey. Jersey City. And my son loves Sucker Punch. Uh-huh. And he sings it, and he's like, son, you're going to do it with me today, right? And when we walked in and we saw the crowd of people, my son was like, mm -hmm. <laughs> But right before I decided to sing the song, he picked up the mic, and wow. I couldn't <laughs> sing the next song because I was crying. <laughs> <laughs> so one, of the, one of the biggest accomplishments I had in my, in, in, in my life. That's amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. Did, did, did you get your son a, a Charlie Brown shirt for that? No. He, he <laughs> actually was thinking about him dressing up as Snoopy, but <laughs> we left that part alone. <laughs> That's funny. Um, so why don't you talk a little bit about um, where you see or, or hope um, Billy Club might go, and you can also you know start talking about the new band that you're in. Well, there was a point in time where I didn't want to play with Billy Club ever again. You yeah. Know? Uh, again, like I said before, a lot of people are different. You know, I had an issue with my drummer at one point because of the things he would say. And uh, it really, really pushed me away to the point where I didn't want to talk to him. Yeah, sure. But I wasn't adult enough to come approach him and tell him, hey, I don't like what you're saying. Hey, I don't like what how you said this, or and so we held that. I held that on for shit, 17, 18 years. Yeah, until recently that we all got back together and we all put everything on top of the table. Yeah, and uh, we are more openly understanding each other now. You know, uh, as Malone is still trying to get himself back together, trying to get his uh, mental state back. You know, we're, we are going to attempt to practice in March. Okay. What I would like to see, I would like to give Billy Club an expiration date. I would like to, you know, get all of our friends, you know, EGH, get our eight back together, have Sworn Enemy and do one big goodbye New York show. You yeah. know, I would love to say do that, you know, but time, only time will tell. Uh, in between of us being on our own hiatus because of a loan situation, you know, I was approached by a, a gentleman by the name of Damien, who's a tattoo artist, and he did a couple of things here and there for me. And uh, he was about to play a show sometime in October. He was like, we want to play the show, but we need a singer. Would you mind trying? Like, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll do it. And as time goes by, you know, we practice once, we practice twice, and I get more news about Billy Club. He's not well, you know, he's alone. I'm like, I got to move forward one way or the other. So I went up and I approached the guy. I'm like, hey, uh, I will help you, but I would like to do this correctly. Yeah. So we got two more weeks for the show, and, you know, I, I'm not really prepared. I'll be in your band, 
if you stay in practice here in Jersey, yeah. If you need to practice in New York, I'm not joining. Yeah, sure. So we've been practicing in Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> and what's uh, what's the name of the band? For the uh, name of the band is called Brass Knuckle Brigade. Brass Knuckle Brigade. Uh, you know, it's a different feel from Billy Club to now a new band for many reasons. Number one. I don't think these guys has ever played in front of them, in front of 500 people. Yeah, yeah. These guys have never recorded. Okay. Uh, these guys have not even pretty much went out of the state. I see. But they are involved in the community. They are yeah, involved sure. in, in, to the You're coming, right? right? Well, the drummer's my age. Um, the drummer and the bassist is mid forty. No, yeah, the bassist is mid forties, and the guitarist. Is in his late thirties, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. So everything is different. Even the conversations we have is different compared to Billy Club. Um, we can mention a band with Billy Club. They're, they're gay. Not no, they're gay. Yeah. Oh, I love Star Wars. That's gay. You know. But with these guys, oh, I like that band. Uh, you know. Uh, you know something uh, bullshit band. It's like uh, it's not bad. Yeah. You know it's yeah. it's different. It's a different perspective. The way that the guys are very much more humble. Yeah. Billy Club's an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> I accept that. Thank you. And 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 not not you know calling everybody an asshole, but it's just that everybody's different the way they see things. Yeah, sure, sure. You know, I may enjoy the re you know the Last Jedi. Somebody in this room no. hates it. No, <laughs> there you go. The, the best of the of the three that were really right, right, right. So you know, it's just it's just a different perspective. No. The guys will talk about you know uh, putting, trying to bring our culture into the music. Yeah, these guys will talk about things that I don't really relate to. Sure, you know, sure. I can't relate to uh, putting nineteen inch chromes on a hydraulic car. I can't relate to that. Yeah, yeah. You know. Uh, I can't relate to getting something expensive and having a good time with it. I, I can't relate to that. Yeah. I don't have the money like that. I bust my ass and work hard. Yeah. My family's not made out of money. Yeah. So there's a different perspective. There's sure. There's different conversations that always goes around into those two groups. Sure. Totally different day and night. Sure. And as far as the sound of uh, Brass Knuckle B Brigade, um, What's Brass Knuckle Brigade sound like? So from the two people that listened to our single, they called it a metallic hardcore entry into something new that I'm producing. Uh, I would I would definitely agree because it's very, there are uh, parts of it that it's very uh, metal, but it still goes back to the same uh to, to our genre, hardcore. Sure. Uh, still beat down and still, you know, there are a couple of songs in the band that we played that I never thought I would do. Yeah. Uh, very fast punk rock star uh, type of style, but again, I'm enjoying it. Yeah. You know, it doesn't always have to be growling and screaming. Sure. You know, on, the, on this particular song that I'm talking about, which is called uh, Making It Home Tonight, I'm actually using my regular voice singing. Ah, uh, okay. You know, so okay. that's different for me, you know. Wow. Uh, that's something also that I did with Billy Club before we stopped playing, which is not scream and growl on every single song, every sure. music. Not only so that I can have more people to understand what I'm saying, but also I'm getting older. Yeah, yeah. hard on the vocal cords, I'm sure, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> so. Um, so one of the questions that is always fun to ask towards the end is, is there, do you think there's a Bronx hardcore sound uh, or Bronx hardcore feel, whatever it might be, and how would you describe it if you think there is? You could just say no. I mean, some people say no, but... Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Bronx hardcore style is more like that. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's really hard to, to, to put it in perspective because, you know, I could give you two different examples. Close call, or District 9, Fahrenheit. Yeah, very different. You know, uh, people can enjoy 
you know, beating the shit out of uh, other people with District 9, or people can enjoy shaving or, you know, driving with Fahrenheit 451, or skating. Yeah. You know, people look at it two different ways. Um, you know, with Fahrenheit and District 9, I, I, again, day and night, totally different style. And again, also because of how we all grew up. Yeah, sure, sure. You know, they... Their music can be a little bit softer, but to me, it's still hard as fuck. It is, yeah, yeah, You know? Yeah. Um, it, it's just, it's just, I guess the diversity of everything, you know? If I ever had a, uh, if I ever had a moment or a time where I can put things together, I would put some of my culture, some of my ideas into the music that I'm putting. Like, I've been always wanting to put, like, a, a bachata band. Yeah. And hardcore together. Yeah. Like that has still has yet to come about. Yeah, I still have the idea for the past twenty two years that I can't get out of my head. Yeah, sure, because sure. Because sure. the guitar is the way the guitar plays with the bachata. How you can just stream right off into hardcore is gonna. If I had the talent, if I had the people and put everything together, I know for sure that we will be touring. Yeah, I know that for a fact. Yeah, but you know, to try to get that people and those things together it's, it's kind of difficult yeah absolutely i mean you you definitely hear some of the 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 latin groove influence and you know especially some of the bass and drum beats and different bronze yeah. bands too but but not to the degree that you know that i think you're talking about um right yeah 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 but, you know not not we're not talking about puya or, or nino you yeah, know yeah, where yeah, yeah. beginning of them will start off with a with a spanish traditional song and then go into a very hard rock and yeah. back to the I want to be harder than that. Absolutely. Yeah, to the yeah, point yeah. where you want to dance with your woman but punch her in the face. <laughs> <laughs> with all the respect. <laughs> a bunch of love. <laughs> 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 oh, that's funny. Um, so I, I have a final question for you, but before I ask it, Mutley, do you have more questions you'd like to ask? I think we covered just about everything that I can think of. Also. Okay. So, uh, Martin, what's the, what does the Bronx mean to you? Hmm. I'm going to say this like if I was still living there. Drugs, a lot of women, and music. Yeah. So drugs, sex, and rock and roll. The rock awesome. and roll dream. <laughs> because it's not just only the rock, you know, you got the hip hop, you got of the course. Spanish. And that's all over the place. Anywhere you go in the Bronx, even if you go to the beach, there's always going to be a festival of just Spanish people or, you know, the, the Spanish culture there. I, I I, can never take that out of uh, when I look at the Bronx. I also look at the Bronx as a place where I learned how to be a man. Yeah. Uh, I got jumped plenty of times. I got my ass beat plenty of times. But because of the hardcore scene, because of me going to shows, because of dancing, and also, very mainly because of uh, James Dijon training me, I have been very more aware. I have been to a point where I know when somebody's about to start marching or run into a crowd or anything like that. You know, now I've been more perceptive on how I even dance, even if I do dance, because I stopped dancing for a long time. You know, I used to be a point where I'm about to jump off stage, run and just stop. Then, oh shit, he didn't jump. And then jump. <laughs> that was the way that I would do it. Yeah, sure. There was a point of time in Sea Beach and in Castle Heights where I would have somebody just fucking just wailing, just wailing and kicking and wailing, but I just make sure that I stand right there and just just make sure that I move in a certain way that they will miss me or not, I'll just block it and kick yeah. them in the ass. Yeah. You know, just Bronx is uh my manhood, my, my place where I became who I am, you know. A lot of people disrespected me and uh, uh, a lot of uh, experience of getting your, 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 your back stabbed. You know, I learned a lot from the Bronx, uh, even uh, being around drugs, you know, yeah. being, being around certain people, you know. Um, I always wanted to be cool like the cool cats and, you know, smoke my cigarettes. But then when I go on stage, I sound like shit. Yeah. So I got to be careful how I do certain things, you know. 
Um, I did the drugs, the sex, and the <laughs> rock and roll. You know, you know, there's there's a lot of people that I've met in this scene that have branched off because of their parents. Yeah, I'll give you a good example. Tammy from Puerto Rico. Her father is uh, Olivencia. He has amazing Spanish hits, you know. But to see her in the scene, yeah. Like, it bugs me the fuck out. Same thing with Tito Puente's son. Like, when he's in the scene, it's like, the fuck are you doing here? I didn't realize he was in the scene. Oh, yeah, he's That's, in the scene. Wow. He's, he's, he's a drummer. Wow. Right. Yeah. And, he, and he's a metal guy. I didn't realize he was a metal guy. Wow. He, he ended up going more in his father's direction because that was where the money yeah, was. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. But, yeah. but he, he definitely, I can't think of any off the top of my head, but he definitely tried out for a few metal wow. bands. Okay. Those, are, those are really great experiences. Wow. And, that, and I put all of that into one. I put yeah. all of that into, you know, I was just, when I was taking my kids to see grandma today, you know, I showed them right across the street from the party of precinct. That's what they sell drugs at. Yeah. How, how did that happen? The precinct is right there. It's like, <laughs> it just happens. You know, it's just the way it is. You know, different stores as I'm going by, there was one store that was closed down for many years. And my tag up is still there. Oh, all seventeen of us have tagged up on that fucking. You wait, know. wait, what'd you write? Oh, I, I I used to write slam. Oh, okay, okay. I okay. used to love slam dancing. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> I didn't realize you were a writer. Okay, okay. You just you just threw your tag up, or just I just threw it. Okay. Yep, uh, I wrote slam, and the other one that I used to write on a six train a lot is venom. Oh, okay. Uh, is that a V-E-N-O-M? It's V-E-N-U-M. And then, of course, uh, it's Smash Arts. They see. No one. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I do have another question for you. Because right. we, we brushed on it before, but we never went back to it. Ooh. And we said we were going to go back to on-stage injuries. Oh, so yes, yes, yes. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Belgium. e Ooh, Man, that was bad. I mean... Let, let's go back to one in Queens many years ago. Kerry Skin, they, I just saw the video. Somebody put the video out. I'm singing, and Kerry Skin pushes me. Now, Kerry Skin is 6'4", six, 6'3", six, yeah. and a fucking brute. So a little small touch yep. yeah. was a fucking push. Yeah, but, uh, there was more to that story. Well, I mean, I was drunk, but that's not the... You were drunk in our medication. Yeah. Because you didn't tell us that for like six months. So, with him pushing me very slow, I fall really hard right on the floor. That's on YouTube. Yes, that is on YouTube. (laughs) Uh, But the Belgium one, we was about to play in front of 9,000? No, it was 5,000. It was probably like four or 5,000. I and I. Biggest crap we ever played for. Yeah. And just to see like this big cover up. You know, on the inside of like a little hall. I, I it was a tent basically. Holy and shit. shit! I started crying, and we was about to play, and all of a sudden, the one comes right next to me, kicks me. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. All right, all right. <laughs> so we started playing. The crowd was going great. It was going great, and I, at the last song, was chin music. Mm. Just like I said before, a lot of people really take that song very hard and yeah. powerful. It just sings along. Was it chin music or slow with your hand? No, it was chin music. Chin music? Okay. I jumped off stage and I let everybody sing. Something here on this corner was just running this way and I didn't even pay attention. Yeah. Guy came up and just boom right on my shoulder. Ooh. This was a full size stage. Not like a small like club yeah, stage. This no. was like an arena level stage. So it was I mean, probably the guy like, took flight. A good, you know, four or five foot stage. Yeah. And then through my peripheral vision, I just see something come up and it just came down. Boom, right on my head and shoulder. And I just I just couldn't move. They sent me to the hospital. The hospital looks like twenty eight weeks later, twenty eight <laughs> days later. Well I had, to, I had to go help you to the medical tent at the fest. Right. Right, and then they sent me to the hospital. And then they and then sent me to the flickering hospital. lights and all of that. Bro, when I got to the hospital, they put me in a little room. What's your name? Hector Ramirez. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
three rooms away, somebody kept hitting themselves on, on the fucking glass until the glass broke. And then they started doing this in the hole of the glass. All of this is bloody. Somebody else who would have came wasn't walking right, and then he fell. And as he's falling, he's trying to he's slamming the, the the crutches on the floor. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> so I go outside and I was like, hey, you know, you just need a sprain. Here's some medicine. So I go outside and there's this guy just he's shaking. And he stops and he looks at me, he goes, Guns up! I, I, I don't understand. Martin? Like, yes. Billy Club, what are you doing here? I was like, I, I, I hurt myself. He's like, what are you doing here? He's like, ah, some kid got fucked up and I just rolled in here. But, you know, would you like to smoke? I'm like, uh, weed, right? <laughs> The way he was shaking, he was freaking me, fucking my not <laughs> freaking me out. Oh, and I guess the the the, the guys who who uh, the the tour manager they found out where I was at. They came and picked me up. Yeah, we sent somebody over because we're all waiting. Like twenty eight weeks later, the fucking hospital. There was nobody there. There was barely anybody. It, it was just fucking scary as fuck. So my name was Hector Ramirez. <laughs> <laughs> That's the worst that I've ever I've got hurt. Okay. Any, any others besides pole position? Uh, besides pole position, no. But I, I heard a lot of. I heard one person really bad who thanked me five months later. <laughs> 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 they couldn't breathe out of their nose structure. Oh, okay. Ages of Man was playing on Starland Ballroom. Oh wow! And one of the one of one of my the favorite songs that I that they played, I, I forgot the name of the song, I, I went to the back and I stage dived and I came down with a, with a knee on this girl, uh, I forgot her name, Valerie. Oh, wow. Okay. I came down on Valerie's shit and I broke her whole shit. Oh, God. Months later, she's like, I don't know, but my doctor's I thanking know. you. Wow. I, I can breathe now. I'm like, <laughs> last time I danced. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, well, Martin, is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap it up? Yeah. Uh, one of the things I do would like to add is that I hope uh, I hope Billy Club can come back to destroy a lot of the bands that are playing now. Because there's a <laughs> lot of bands that I, I... Listen, I'm not conceited. I'm not that type of person. I'm very humble, but there's a lot of fucking whack-ass bands out there. That just, <laughs> And they're getting fucking attention. I'm like, what, what the fuck? What, what happened to us? Like, seriously? <laughs> um, but I would like to have, I would like to get my brothers back on stage. I, will, I, I miss that tremendously. More importantly, I would like to see Malone back to where he needs to be. Yeah. And if that doesn't happen, well, you know what? I, I wish him the best. I hope that he gets better. And then I can move on with my new project. Yeah, because I'm enjoying with what I'm doing now, and with the ideas and the collaboration that we're about to do in the next couple of months, it can be bigger than Billy Club, which I kind of, I, I can't say that I doubt it because, again, different guys, different perspective, different everything. Yeah, it could change everything. Everything could change at the end, but I miss being on stage. Yeah, and now that I have this, this uh, new platform to put out my ideas, my suggestions, and my experience, I'm really looking forward to it. I would like for it to be with Billy Club, but, you know, only time can tell. So I cannot let, I can't wait for that tick to stop. Sure. Because I don't know how long I'm going to be here. Yeah. So I got to keep going. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Well, thank you so much, Martin. You're very welcome. Thank you. So one more thing, because uh, we talked about it a little bit with a few people, but talk to us about some people that, that aren't with us anymore. The little Greg, uh, Saab, another another dude oh, who wow. we actually look up to. Uh, we were, mentioned rabies before. Rabies, one hundred percent. He was my. We talk about rabies a lot. He was he rabies was definitely my hardcore mentor. He was my hardcore mentor in the political sense of hardcore. Yeah. Saab was more like, stop being a fucking pussy. <laughs> uh, there was a point in time where I think, I think I got slapped 
by a couple of DMS dudes for no reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, I went outside. I was pissed the fuck off. And I saw Sop coming across the street towards the, the club as I'm walking away. He goes, oh, where you going? He's like, fucking guys and fucking this. And, you know, I almost got jumped. He goes, are you going to leave because of them? Get the fuck out of here, bro. <laughs> if that's what you're going to do, then go fucking by. <laughs> I made sure that I saw him the following week. You yeah. know? But uh, he, he really pushed me to the point where stop being a little bitch and, you know, step up to the plate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, little Greg... I, I can't really say much besides that I miss him dearly, man. He he was one person that I could actually have a decent conversation and not about hardcore at all. Sure, sure. It was always about life and how he's going to move to the next uh, section of his life and what he's going to do with his kids. Like it was a beautiful moment, you know. But uh, I miss a lot of them. Uh, little Greg, Paulie Nonek, another one who was just. Now, little Greg. So, EGH, Irate, and Billy Club, when we played in the same bill, we would talk about taking each other lunch money. <laughs> what that meant was taking the crowd away from the band. Uh huh. Who was the biggest reaction? Friendly competition. Yeah, friendly competition. Now, little Greg used to call him Mighty Mouse because he used to climb on shit and just fucking jump all over the place. He used to call him Spider Man because he was hanging from. <laughs> One of the things that little Greg used to do was fuck me up when I'm singing. Every time when I would stomp, he would know when I was stomping. He would grab my fucking ankle. <laughs> and I would miss the whole floor and just, you know, fall down. Same thing with uh, with um, Paulie Nomek. Oh. Every time uh, he's about to sing, he'll, he'll clip the microphone and then walks away. I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> so those are really good things. Good memories I got of those guys, you know, you know, and, and getting the lunch money. I mean, between <laughs> between Irate and uh, Billy Club, it was it was like this. I mean, Irate, EGH, and Billy Club. Was yeah, but that then, way. yeah, I was about to say yeah. EGH was climbing, and I don't know what happened. And then we started taking a lot of their lunch money. And then, <laughs> and then Irate joined in, and it was just back and forth. Irate and Billy Club. Irate and Billy Club. So those are those those were experience that I felt like it needed to be said, you know. Also, uh, I do want to mention also James Deshawn. Like if it wasn't for him, especially the way he would fucking he would work me the fuck out. It was just, just, just to be clear, he's still around. Oh, I know, I know. <laughs> he we used to practice we talking about a people with pets. six foot three. Uh, basement and he's six foot two. Wow. And it was closed in, it was next to the furnace, so it was hot, there was no air, and we would fucking practice there. To the point there was so many times which I mean, at least once a week, you know, we would spar and just <laughs> and just knock right the fuck out. And he would knock me the fuck out. He would fucking put me down. A nice elbow to the jaw, a nice uppercut. I'll just go to sleep and just start thinking about my kids. You know? <laughs> Will I see them again? Just... <laughs> or will I die in this face? <laughs> right. But yeah, but you know, that being with James, James, he really, he really showed me not only just the aspect of fighting, but the confidence, just the, the, the strength. You know, there was a point in time where I almost got jumped by a band called Body Bag, and all of them were fucking bodybuilding. Yeah. I was ready to take on each and every one of them because of the confidence that I got because of James. Wow. Even though they uh, apologize at the end. But that that, that's, that doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you know, just just a lot of a lot of situations like that really made me who I am now. Yeah. You know, being humble, being quiet, being nice. That's all my mom straight. That's all from her, from her family, but the aggressiveness, the the making the, the smart decisions now, because I wasn't making smart decisions before, but now I'm more focused, I'm more alive, especially with the new band. Yeah. That's why I would love to play with Billy Club, because I know for sure we'll be much stronger, yeah. much tighter. But until time will tell, I need to keep moving forward to another direction. Thank you so much, Martin. Of course.